Since it is time to start the 2024 Fukushima Medical University International Symposium on the Fukushima Health Management Survey, I would like to declare the opening of this uh, symposium. Now, I would like to ask the Nolet Kenneth to act as a MC. And Nolet, uh, Dr. Nolet, please. Thank you, Ms. Tsuchiya. Welcome to the 2024 International Symposium on the Fukushima Health Management Survey. Today's hybrid symposium includes online participants, a live audience here in Tokyo, and another at Fukushima Medical University's School of Health Sciences. Hello. I'm Kenneth Nolet, an American by birth and, since 2008, a resident of Fukushima by choice. Once again, we are fortunate to have reporters, journalists, and videographers on site and online today. Honest, independent media are essential in today's world, and we are grateful to have earned your time your attention, and your service to readers, listeners, and viewers around the world. Let's begin with words from FMU President Takenoshita Seiji, whose long service includes prior appointments as our hospital director and vice president, during which he guided much of our response to the 2011 earthquake, tsunami, and nuclear crisis. President Takenoshita. I am Takenoshita uh, from the Fukushima uh, Medical University. First of all, I'd like to express my deepest condolences to the families who have uh, lost their lives, uh, property, and their livelihood in the 2024 Noto Peninsula earthquake. And we uh, continuously send in the medical team and we are providing the support activities based on our experience from uh, 311. We are hoping that the earliest time, um, earliest possible time recovery. So in, it is an honor to welcome you to our 2024 International Symposium on the Fukushima Health Management Survey. This year, we have decided to hold that symposium in Tokyo uh, for the first time as a main venue uh, with the satellite venue in Fukushima. In the strong hope that not only uh, people of uh, Fukushima Prefecture, but also people throughout Japan and around the world to know about the findings achievement of Fukushima Health Management Survey. We thank you very much and also and the typical Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant it will be 13 years uh, very shortly. And uh, we'd like to express our sincere gratitude for your tremendous kindness and support during this period. After the disaster, FMU declared our commitment to support the revitalization of Fukushima from health and medical perspective immediately after 311 disaster. And since then, in addition to the traditional mission to education, research, and medical care, we have pursued our historical mission of protecting the health of the people in Fukushima. Uh, the last 13 years have a series of new challenges for the university to achieve these missions at the higher level. And we have finally reached the stage where we can turn our sincere and relentless efforts from the desperate environment into hopes and dreams and pass them on to 
the future generations. And this symposium is organized from the viewpoint of uh, turning the experiences and knowledge we have gained from revitalization processes from the unprecedented complex disaster into the systematic and the universal shared knowledge of the humankind. We hope that all participants in this sim uh, symposium from Japan and abroad will be fully engaged in our discussions um, and uh, offer opinions from their own respective perspectives. May this symposium be fruitful for all of you who participate. Takenoshita Seiichi, I'm a president and also the dean of the FMU. Uh, it will be a long-term uh, symposium, but uh, please stay with us till the end. Thank you very much. Thank you, President Takenoshita. Incidental to President Takenoshita's always busy schedule, he's actually spent the last couple of afternoons attending ceremonial last lectures from professors of retirement age here at FMU. This is a poignant reminder of our need to transmit the experiences of 311 to subsequent generations. As evidence of our efforts in this direction, among today's participants are some of the most longest serving professors at FMU, along with some of the youngest professors at FMU. You'll be hearing from them later. Now, Let's hear a recorded message from Governor Uchibori Masao. Good morning, everyone. I am Masao Uchibori, the governor of Fukushima Prefecture. In 2010, and it is an honor to have this opportunity to extend my greeting to all of you at the opening of a 2024 Fukushima Medical University International Symposium on the Fukushima Health Management Service. And thank you very much for joining us today for, from Japan abroad. And uh, let me uh, also express my deep respect for the past research activities and thank you once again for your ongoing understanding and support for the revitalization of um, Fukushima. And in light of the accident at Tepco's Fukushima Daiichi nuclear plant, nuclear power plant, the Fukushima Prefecture government has conducted Fukushima Health Management Survey with the cooperation of the Fukushima Medical University in order to maintain and promote the health of all residents of the prefecture for the future. As two years will have um, soon passed since the nuclear power plant accident, there is a concern that the uh, memories of the accident will fade and the misunderstanding caused by rumors will become fixed. In order to, uh, for people to properly realize the Fukushima now, it is necessary to continue uh, to disseminate easy to understand information based on the scientific evidence, such as the result of the survey and further expand the correct, correct understanding of radiation. Today's symposium will be the first to be held in Tokyo metropolitan area. By reviewing the Fukushima Health Management Survey so far, uh, sharing our experiences uh, the, and the scientific findings obtained through the survey and uh, deepening the discussion, I expect that the latest information will be widely disseminated from here in Tokyo to the rest of Japan and the world. The Fukushima Prefecture government will continue to work closely with the um, Fukushima Medical University, including Fukushima Health Management Survey, to ensure the safety and security of the people in Fukushima. I would like to ask for your continued support and cooperation with your extensive experience and knowledge to our effort. And in closing, let me express my 
best wishes for the fruitful symposium and for the continued good health and success of all those attending today, including those who are participating online. Thank you, Governor Uchibori. For those of you not familiar with Fukushima City, the governor's residence is just one block away from the prefectural head offices. Before 311, a governor could do his job within a small radius. But since 311, our governor has become kind of an international ambassador for Fukushima in particular and Japan in general, as we try and help the world understand that it's safe and delicious to enjoy our seafood and the products from Fukushima's rich agricultural land. So we are grateful for his efforts in all of these regards. So we're also grateful that he took the time to give us this message, even though he couldn't physically be here at the venue. Now it's a pleasure to introduce FMU General Vice President Oto Hitoshi, whose biography appears on pages eight and nine. As a professor emeritus, Dr. Oto helps direct the Fukushima Health Management Survey while continuing to be active in the academic discipline of transfusion medicine, especially in regard to maternal, fetal, and neonatal health. Professor Oto. Yes, thank you, Norit. Thank you for your kind introduction. Let me introduce Dr. Yasumura Seiji. He took office as a president of uh, a professor of Fukushima FMU as a radiation uh, executive director, Radiation Medical Science Center for Fukushima Health Management Survey. We started conducting FM, FHMU, and he launched a center and uh, led in the effort to stipulate the protocol. He has been uh, consistently made an effort to protect the health of the resident. After uh, Dr. Kamiya, he uh, was appointed at the uh, head of the center. He has making a steady effort to protect the resident health. Thank you for your kind introduction and a good morning. My name is Yasumura. I am the head of Radiation Medical Center for FHMS. First, uh, let me extend my gratitude for being able to host the 2024 FMU International Symposium for the Fukushima Health uh, Management Survey. As the governor noted, it's important uh, opportunity for us to send the messages to the world about Fukushima. Also, I'd like to express uh, my a gratitude for Dr. May Abdel Wahab, uh, who have kindly accepted our invitation to the keynote lecture. Although she, she is not able to join us uh, face to face here, but uh, she will deliver the keynote address online and as well as the participation to the discussion. Let me give you the overview of the Fukushima Health Management Survey. During the session one, doctors in charge of each component of FHMS will give you presentations. In session two, we will also cover a various activity conducted in the prefecture so that uh, you would understand more about uh, their achievement. It is uh, a full day session. I hope you would stay until the end. Thank you. Let's move on to the, my presentation. I will cover these four topics. The first topic, 
is the nuclear disaster after the Great East Japan earthquake and its impact on people. One hundred through six, one thousand six hundred people lost their lives in Fukushima due to earthquake and the tsunami, which is less than the death toll in Mi Miyagi or Iwate. However, it is still high. Also, uh, we have to take note of the number of disaster-related deaths. 2,337 died of that uh, died uh, because of disaster-related death cause. But I'd like to emphasize here one thing. Uh, what is called a tribal disaster? What's the situation? However, none of the resident had deceased because of the radiation. After the earthquake, radioactive substances were released from the typical Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant and Okumamachi, Futabamachi, and other municipalities recorded the very high air dose rate, about uh, 100 microsieverts per hour. That air, high air dose rate declined over time, but uh, right after the disaster, the rate was quite high. Uh, please bear in mind it was uh, 100. And the blue uh, line shows the Fukushima city's uh, air dose rate, which is uh, distanced from 100 kilometer from the plant. And this is 2.74. So uh, it's uh, close to 3 microsievert. And uh, it is a low figure compared to the, the ones at the, at the, the rate at the municipalities closer to the micro, uh, nuclear power plant. It is still relatively high. And uh, due to the climate on the day uh, in Fukushima, we have detected somewhat considerable air dose rate, unlike Iwaki and Aizuwakamatsu city, and they also uh, declined over time. Air yeah, dose, uh, those uh, map after one month after the disaster, uh, the wind flew northwest and then south. And Hamadori area are uh, close to the coast, and Nagadori in the mid, and Aizu further west, and a considerable amount, an uncertain amount of those was recorded. And according to the those distribution, the uh, government uh, designated evacuation area and evacuation area and other evacuation classification areas. About 2,000 people died because of the disaster. But that figure include deaths uh, because of uh, indirect cause of the disaster. Compared to Iwate and Miyagi, disaster-related fatality is especially high. And also, if you look at the age group distribution, uh, ages 20 and younger and 21 to 65 and ages 66 and older, you would notice that uh, uh, elderly population st uh, stand out from the left. So there is a high, very high percentage of the deaths uh, among older people and indirect non did related fatalities as well. That's why we started the FM, FHMS, Fukushima Health Management Survey. 
the purpose is to relieve anxiety after a nuclear accident and to protect and promote the long-term health of Fukushima residents. And ultimately, the goal is to protect and promote the long-term health of Fukushima residents. Of course, a direct uh, uh, impact of the radioactive substances are uh, one of the purposes, but uh, the goal of the FHMS ultimately is to protect and promote the long-term health of the residents. Uh, this is how FHMS is set up. To the left, you will see basic survey. Uh, of all, all the residents, 2 million residents were eligible for the uh, basic study to estimate the overall dose rate. And on the right, and you would see TUE titled examination and the comprehensive health check on CHC and the mental health and lifestyle survey and the pregnancy and the birth survey for components. The purpose is to ascertain health conditions from epidemiological um, co viewpoint. Uh, what is on the left is the uh, cause, and on the right, there are outcomes. In terms of the purpose, uh, our, one of our ultimate goal is to uh, make the data set and analyze it to ensure good follow-up. And in order to deliver good follow-up, you need evidence and good data. That's how the entire FHMS is set up. Here is the detail. And in session one, each component uh, go, is going to be explained by the by each doctor. So let me go over uh, just the um, overview of it. So uh, let me uh, talk about first the uh, basic survey. Over two billion people were eligible and. 460,000 returned the questionnaire, which, and then uh, my message here is that uh, expo external exposure of the initial four months period is less than uh, 5 milli sieveld in 99.8% of the respondent. As a result, that we consider that the radiation level is not at a level where health effect can be confirmed with statistical significance. And then uh, we conducted the TUE, and the first round was, uh, in the first round, uh, 730,000 were eligible for the preliminary. And then a full-scale survey was conducted. And for this uh, survey, there are advantages and disadvantages. It's important to uh, understand uh, advantages and disadvantages uh, before making a decision to uh, take the examination. So we consider it is important to uh, create an explanatory materials and sometimes conduct one-on-one -on -one explanatory sessions uh, so that uh, a resident can make an informed decision. Last year, we also created an explanatory animation video for young generation. So far, we have uh, concluded uh, the fifth round. Malignant or uh, ma suspicious for malignancy cases are uh, to, to date, we have uh, detected 328 cases. In a preliminary baseline survey, we detected 116 and then 71 and 31 until 5, and it's on a constant decline. 
the eligible uh, resident were uh, 367,000, and now it has declined slightly less than 300,000. This graph shows that the uh, uh, different behavior uh, for evacuation resulted in different uh, exposure dose. And according to ANSCA, the average absorbed dose to the thyroid in the first year to infant was uh, 2 milligray to 30 milligray. The similar estimation was made to Chernobyl uh, accident evacuees and then the uh, mean thyroid dose was 330 milligray uh, for Ukraine. So according to that unscaled data, the Fukushima's uh, average absorbed dose is very significantly lower than the Ukraine dose. And based on the result, we have conducted uh, analysis using multiple methodologies. The current method is nested case control study, where the uh, case group is compared to control group using uh, multiple uh, variant, and we made multiple modifications, and the result is, is on the right. The horizontal axis, the dose, and uh, vertical axis, the, uh, the odds ratio, the detection ratio, and our uh, conclusion is that there is no uh, significant dose effect ratio. It was already uh, reported to Prefectural Oversight Committee. And the committee's view is um, that there is no evidence of an association between thyroid cancer and radiation exposure. Uh, our view also agrees to that. We also uh, con offer support to residents who took the pre primary examination and the confirmatory examination. Next, comprehensive health check, or CHC. All the residents uh, in the 30 municipality were eligible, amounting to 210,000 residents. According to age groups, check items are different, but the purpose is to uh, gauge the health effect of the evacuation. The result, as you can see in the mid, a risk factor seems to have increased. However, on an overall level, no findings indicated radiation effects were found in the, re, uh, in the result of the CHC. In the CHC, based on the result, uh, we have uh, provided the leaflets and conducted the seminar in support of the residents. Next, mental health and lifestyle survey or uh, MHLS, uh, whose uh, eligible, eligibility is completely the same with the uh, CHC, we send a questionnaire to the eligible uh, residents to assess their mental health and lifestyle. This shows the percentage of the resident who require uh, mental support, uh, it's on the constant decline. Uh, however, uh, recently it uh, seems to come up and which we are really concerned with. And 3.0% uh, shows the average all Japan. So among evacuees, uh, the percentage is 6.1%, 6.1% uh, require mental support. 
The next question is children. Uh, indicator used here is SDQ, score of 16 or higher, means that the child uh, require special support. The result in all age category showed a higher percentage, but uh, fortunately, the mental status of children has improved to almost to the same level of all Japan level. However, there are resident with uh, mental health issue and lifestyle issue. They need special care, so we offer the care. And also, we uh, approach uh, groups to reduce risks. The last component is PBS, or Pregnancy and Birth Survey. In uh, 2011, right after the disaster, there were a lot of um, uh, disastrous uh, media report like uh, that you cannot deliver, for example, you should not get pregnant in Fukushima because you cannot deliver a baby. That daunting headlines uh, made uh, 17,000 pregnant women very unhappy and anxious. We decided to provide uh, necessary care for them and st started sending questionnaire to them as part of the PBS. We also conducted the follow-up survey with midwives and public health nurses and certified public psychologists. Later, we will show you and explain the details. We um, looked at the preterm delivery and the low birth weight infant and the congenital anomalies percentages. And there are some misunderstandings. And every year, uh, we report the result of these indicators. And in any one of the indicators, Fukushima's percentage is not higher than the national average in 10 years. So uh, there hasn't been any major issue. That's why we decided to terminate PBS. A lot, a, a lot of pregnant women uh, expressed anxiety and uh, depression when we uh, conducted a telephone-based survey, but such people's percentage is on the decline. This is a summary that I put on the report. We have to uh, be interactive and uh, conduct public relations activities in an engaging way. And also it's important to uh, share the information that is really needed by the resident. Last component, as Governor Uchibori noted, uh, one thing that we still regret is that when we conduct a survey nationwide, and ask them if they think that uh, there is a heritable radiation health effect, particularly to Fukushima. About 40% say yes, there is a high heritable radiation health effect risk. And we consider this is quite problematic. As I mentioned earlier, the, the congenital anomaly rate is not high no higher than the national average. Lastly, uh, the disaster's effect is still unfolding. The important point I'd like to emphasize is the core part of the problem is whether the dignity of the place of living is maintained. We want to uh, protect Fukushima so that uh, a resident can live an ordinary life with a peace of mind. This is the end of my presentation. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Yasumura.
It's been 13 years since we started the FHMS. From Fukushima and Fukushima resident to the world and maybe to the next generation, if there is any message you want to send, share it from he now. Strong message. This is the sixth symposium. What I want to tell is what's really happening, the realities. What's happening in Fukushima now? That needed to be told without distortion. And then there wouldn't be any misunderstanding or prejudice. From the world or maybe the resident outside of the Fukushima, what's happening in Fukushima is not their business. But if your a town is located close to the nuclear power plant and if the plant causes an accident, you would experience the same. So please remember Fukushima and do not forget. What we have learned from the people of Fukushima it's a pleasure to introduce FMU professors Shimura Hiroki and Ohira Tetsuya, whose biographies appear on pages 14 through 17. Both were appointed as professors in 2013, greatly enhancing our post-disaster expertise. Gentlemen. Hi. Uh so I'm the chair for session one. My name is Shimura. My name is Ohira. Thank you very much for having us. So without further ado, we want to start with the first presentation. Ms. Dr. Antetsuo Ishikawa from FMU. The title of the presentation is experience in those estimation involving around 2 million people for the basic survey. If you go to page 18, you can find his biography. Dr. Ishikawa, the floor is yours. And this is Ishikawa from my side. I want to walk you through about the basic survey. So let me begin. So this is the circumstances in early post-accident period in pre uh, Fukushima Prefecture and also overall in Japan that the environment radiation level arose sharply. As you see on the graph on the bottom left, you can find the ambient radiation dose in Fukushima City from March 11th, the day uh, the earthquake occurred, to the end of the month. Before the accident, the level was about 0.05 as a value, but after the accident, it went up to 24. The figures in the graph are in microsieverts per hour. About six months after the accident, as you see in these photos, municipalities distributed personal do um, dosimeters to the uh, residents, and in to um, measure or estimate the dose. And, af and after that, as you see in this picture, the monitoring post to indicate the uh, air dose, ambient dose rate. However, right after the accident, this kind of measuring devices of the dose or uh, devices were not uh, available widely. So residents to uh, understand their own dose level was very difficult. So therefore, so resi uh, residents were asked to record and send back information on their behavior in the uh, early post-accident period. Individual ex uh, external doses were estimated based on their behaviors and notified to the respondents by post. This is the basic survey. The purpose of this survey was to ascertain the overall level of exposure of the residents in Fukushima Prefecture and to provide basic data for subsequent health management. The eligible, eligible people 
were the resident, um, registered residents in uh, Fukushima Prefecture between March 11th and uh, July uh, 1st, 2011. Uh, we covered about uh, 2 million people. So distribution of a questionnaire was started uh, to uh, those people at the end of June 2011. And you can see that uh, image of the questionnaire on the slide. So basically, we um, the people who lived in Fukushima Prefecture at that time who were registered uh, in another prefecture and all those who commit to work or school in Fukushima, uh, the prefecture from outside the prefecture were also eligible for the program upon um, request. This is a sample of the main section of the questionnaire filled by the residents. From March 11th to March 25th, the residents were asked to populate this uh, form, including their whereabouts uh, on the hourly basis and if they were uh, they stayed indoors or outdoor. After March 26th until June July 11th, it was a simplified form. They uh, filled in the place of the residence and average time they spent outdoor and also where they went to school or work. So this form was used uh, until July 11th so that the estimate, those estimation period uh, was also for four months. This co uh, survey covered all age groups. Minors were required to submit the form with the signature of their parents or guardian. So this is an image of how the dose was estimated. As I showed you before in the questionnaire, they uh, populated a way about, and it is uh, converted into latitude and also longitude. Uh, longitude. And it was overlaid uh, with ambient dose rate uh, map in the computer in order to estimate the individual's exposure dose. As it was in the questionnaire earlier, where they spend uh, you know, time in indoor and outdoor. That is also included if they were in indoors. The seating effect of the, uh, of the building was also factored into the estimate. This calculation uh, um, program was developed by National Institute of Radiological Science at that time. So this is the uh, um, flow of the basic survey. And they are, the first um, flow is to notify and provide information to the residents and also uh, the survey to grasp the overall trends. So there are two um, uh, main flows. So we distributed the questionnaire and after those are populated, it was sent back by post. However, we are not just waiting for the you know, mail to come in. Uh, we tried to outreach uh, and to, uh, we went out to the place where uh, people gather so that we were able to collect the questionnaires or the response. And this is how we supported our residents to fill in the questionnaires. And the collected questionnaire was in handwriting. We needed to digitize so that we were able to put into the program. So if there is any information missing in the questionnaire, for example, they just filled in. They were at the relative's house about the where, uh, whereabouts, and we were not able to convert that information into latitude and longitude. So we needed to contact them in order to get the exact address where they were um, staying. So we uh, contacted uh, over 60 million people in order to populate more information into the questionnaire. And after doing this, uh, we tried to digitize uh, the activity record. Right after we, uh, we sent the questionnaires, we received uh, a lot of responses. At the peak, uh, we received about 8,000 responses a day. So for um, every response, our every respondents, uh, we notified the result of dose estimate and so forth. And also, uh, we gathered information by age and also area, and uh, we submit that uh, information to the oversight committee, and also we have publicized our paper. This was in the earlier slide. This is how we supported the residents how to write uh, and uh, fill in the um, questionnaire. We went to the place where residents gather 
if they did not submit the response of the questionnaire, then we help them to uh, fill in the questionnaire. In the past, uh, we visited like a temporary housing and also TUE venue and also a health health check ben, uh, venue in each um, uh, cities and the villages and also at the city hall building. This is uh, since this is the support we offered, but overall response rate was 27.7% in the prefecture. However, there was a difference in different areas. We have a mark showing the different response rate in each area where uh, nuclear power plant was and also the uh, areas um, uh, around that was the response rate was around 40 percent and there were eight municipalities with over 50 percent response rate but overall the response rate was not really high that's why we have done the research over representativeness and due to the interest of time we will i will not go into the details however because of the study uh, we, uh, we uh, uh, was able to identify all the uh, responses we collected were did not have any bias and it represented the entire prefecture and this is that uh, some uh, part of the form we notified uh, to each individual so after we get the response we notified the dose estimate to each individual the form the time period uh, that the form was on uh, for the activity record was for the four month time, but some people did not remember all the activities. However, there are responses which covered less than four months. In order to notify the, uh, uh, those estimate, we uh, notified a time period used to estimate their dose level and also that dose estimate uh, result. So far, we have notified the dose estimate uh, result to about 555,000 people. So this, the people who are filled in four months uh, activity records, and we this is a result of their dose estimate at the prefecture level. Uh, about 467,000 uh, people responded to the questionnaire, and we have gathered the data. And as you see here, the average is about 0.8, and the uh, no, maximum was 25 mil uh, severed, and the majority of the people were below 3 mil uh, severed. And the, based on the place they lived at the time of the accident, we have done the categorization, and we calculated the, calculated the average dose, which is shown in this map. So, so area where the um, uh, nuclear power plant exists, but um, uh, many of the people, uh, the dose result was less than three mil uh, um, severed. In, in the uh, oversight committee, we had four months. Based on the four months worth of uh, dose estimate, however, it is unlikely that uh, the, the radiation uh, the uh, radiation dose uh, impacted uh, the residents' uh, health conditions. That was the result of the evaluation. We gathered activity record from the residents, and I want to show you some examples from the power plant within the 20 kilometers radius. Right after the uh, next day, after the um, the, uh, the earthquake. The evacuation order was issued, and about one month later, in the areas clad with uh, yellow, it was uh, uh, there was uh, uh, a concern that the uh, cumulative dose level could reach 20 mil sievert. So it was uh, designated as planned evacuation areas. For example, uh, Idate uh, village and also Nam a part of uh, Namie uh, town too. In those areas, from the day it was designated and they were uh, uh, they needed to evacuate within a month of course uh, exact date uh, people evacuated were different uh, person by person that were that was the assumption the who and also unscare those international uh, um, institutions have reported uh, have done uh, the uh, those uh, assess, uh, the uh, estimate for the residents in fukushima prefecture you can find that the conditions on the right at who and you have seen that the namie uh, town and also idate village they defined those areas as most impacted or affected by the uh, accident. The people in those areas 
WHO's as of 12, uh, 2012 uh, uh, report, uh, assuming that they lived uh, in that planned evacuation area for four months and staying you know, eight hours uh, outdoor, which is a very you know, uh, safe uh, 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 the assumption. And their evaluation result was 10 to 50 mil uh, surveyed. And the 2013 unscare report and, uh, was issued. And after that, there was unscare 2020 and 2021 report using the actual evaluation evacuation patterns, pa patterns which were uh, uh, gathered by basic survey. The actual result was one-tenth of those uh, international institutions report. So from the WHO report, you can, from this data, you can find how important it is to do the, uh, the estimation based on their activities. So, as I said, that the behavior or activity report was used in order to estimate the, uh, the, the dose. And at the same time, uh, this is used to uh, to uh, estimate the internal exposure too. And apart from uh, FHNS, after the accident, the waterborne and uh, also that the airborne radio uh, iodine uh, concentration uh, in the evaluation was done too. So uh, using this and also activity report, uh, analyzing those like the internal uh, dose uh, in the tile, uh, thyroid gland and also the inhalation uh, dose uh, were, uh, were estimated. And also that how much was uh, taken in, in, with the water. And um, so the external dose estimation from the basic survey was converted into external thyroid doses and the internal thyroid doses were added together and used for case control studies on thyroid cancer. <laughs> So this is a summary of what I reported. So due to the time, I will not go into the details. Uh, would you please read this um, summary? I appreciate if you can read this summary. That's all for my part. Thank you very much. Dr. Ishikawa, thank you very much. If you have any questions, Please, you know, um, use the question form. So, the topic is the, the current status of the thyroid ultrasound examination and scientific findings. Dr. Furuya, please. So, uh, please take a look at the um, program uh, for his uh, background information. Uh, my name is Furuya from Fukushima Medical University. I'd like to talk about the current status of the thyroid ultrasound examination and scientific findings. So this is the agenda for my presentation. So in the finding of the thyroid ultrasound examination is a thyroid uh, cancer and also the relationship with the radiation exposure. And next, that as a um, possible uh, related factor uh, is what I'd like to present to you. Lastly, the current initiative for the TUE and the future initiative for TUE. And in the beginning, uh, regarding the uh, thyroid gland, I'd like to briefly talk about this. Uh, thyroid uh, gland is um, at the uh, neck area. Uh, it is uh, under the, the neck cartridge, and this is expansion and thyroid. And the uh, and the folia, follicular cell and the follicular lumen are the components and the, the hormone T4 and T3, thyroid hormone are generated by this. And the generated uh, uh, hormone uh, is uh, uh, disseminated into the blood. Uh, on the other hand, that the, uh, for instance, the uh, uh, there are some times that the cyst and the nodule, in, and the cyst and the nodule 
uh, can be observed by the ultrasound uh, examination. And in the Fukushima Health Management uh, Survey, ultrasound testing is done uh, so that uh, we can uh, uh, check the presence of uh, cyst and uh, uh, nodule. Uh, because of, there is a possibility of, of the hidden uh, cyst and uh, uh, nodule. And once that is found, then, and depending on the uh, size of that, uh, uh, the grade B or grade A are determined, 20.1 milli or uh, larger for uh, cyst, and also 5.1 milli or larger of the um, nodule, and then uh, the secondary testing or examination will be done. Uh, that uh, confirmatory examination is done uh, with the blood test and the urine test. And according to the diagnostic standard, if that the uh, malicious is uh, uh, suspicious, then the uh, systology is uh, conducted. And as a result of, the, uh, of that, if the uh, malignance or possible uh, malignance is uh, found, and that will uh, be moved to that the uh, treatment covered by the insurance. This shows you the outline of the um, TUE uh, practice so far. And after, right after the disaster, in the residents of Fukushima, the 18 years old at the time of uh, disaster are uh, the people covered and and this is the uh, the target and and uh, as a preliminary baseline survey the primary one is uh, uh, started uh, from October 2011 then and for the purpose of a comparison, the full-scale survey are conducted from the second to the fifth round uh, um, until above 20 uh, every two years and uh, above 25 years old uh, every five years the examination is conducted. And so far, the five, fifth round has been completed. And up to the fifth round, uh, this shows you the result of the examination. In the preliminary baseline survey, and the 367,000 people uh, were covered, and the participation rate was 81.7%. And in the preliminary uh, examination, 0.8% were moved to the confirmatory uh, testing, and 92.2% uh, participated uh, this testing. and. 116 people were uh, diagnosed as a malignance uh, or the suspicious of a malignance. And uh, in, since 2017, uh, we started occasional examination uh, which covers 25 years old and higher. And from the result, uh, let me talk about the findings we have gained. The first thing, is the relationship with the thyroid cancer and also the radiation, radiation exposure doses. As already mentioned, uh, let me talk about more detail. For the internal exposure uh, doses, is, uh, is the estimation we uh, have from the water and also that the uh, internal exposure uh, doses. Then 1.1 is uh, used to calculate the number of the in the up to fourth round, and also 20 and uh, the testing from uh, 25 years old, and the people who were born in uh, uh, who, uh, from the 2012 and the 18 who have. Um, uh, the uh, question about the malignancy. And in 2012 to 2018, out of the cases registered in the basic survey, uh, if there are uh, behavior records and they are the eligible uh, population, and also as a control, the um, sex and birth and the malignancy or suspicion of uh, malignancy through participation 
And also, the, including the participation, uh, the primary uh, examination and records are used. And so that uh, we were randomly selected at the ratio of one to three, the cases to control. And this shows you the characteristic of the people. And the cases uh, were registered as 153, and the control was 459. And the age at the time of disaster was uh, on average 12.9. And also, oh, this is the um, 2.3 to 2.1 as a medium of the uh, uh, the equivalent. And this is the shown um, result, uh, thyroid equivalent doses. The blue bar is odds ratio one. And in that the uh, eligible people are uh, three millisievert to or lower, or three to uh, 12, or um, over 10 millisievert. And in each of the group, we have a um, uh, calculated that odds ratio. And uh, in uh, all of the group, odds ratio was about uh, one. There was no statistically meaningful change. And from this result, um, therefore, malignant or malignant, uh, suspicious malignant, detection and uh, detection ratio, and the exposure uh, uh, doses, there was no significant relationship. Then, and uh, let me talk about the thyroid uh, cancer and also the possible factor for the thyroid cancer. And this has been shown to you already. And this is outline of the TUE. And the yellow part is the participation rate of the primary exam. And also that the lower one is the participation rate of the conf um, confirmatory exam. 92.9% was the initial participation rate. But the, the primary exam and the confirmatory exam, and uh, there was an inclining or that a uh, reducing trend as we repeated the exams. And we, it's been pointed out there are regional differences of the participation rate. And you can see that map of Fukushima, evacuation area is yellow and Hamadori in this blue, uh, green is Nakadori, Aizu is orange. And, and the, the participation rate of the confirmatory exam is shown on the, the upper uh, chart. And it used to be 80 to 90%, but there were some regional differences. So 89 to 92%. So three to four percent variances were found. And also that the, uh, uh, see, this is the confirmatory examination at the lower chart. And for this uh, participation rate, it's lower, 78% uh, to 70%. So eight to 6% differences of the participation rate was uh, observed. And next, and in that the confirmatory uh, um, examination when it was diagnosed as B, B, and this is a cytology participation rate, and the coloring is the same as the one before. And the upper right is the uh, execution rate of the cytology for the primary survey, 47% in yellow, and uh, we had the much differences among the uh, uh, region uh, for the preliminary baseline survey, and the five to eight percent for the, the confirmatory exam. And there are some differences by region, so these factors can impact the detection of the thyroid cancer. And next. Uh, I'm showing you again the outline of the uh, exam and the ratio or the detection rate of the B diagnosis. And in the 0.8% in the preliminary, uh, preliminary baseline survey, 
But in that the full scale survey, 0.8 to 0.7, not much difference. And starting from 2017, uh, for 25 years old, B rate is 5.5% as diagnosed as B. And this is such, uh, this shows you the probability of getting the grade B and also malignancy or suspicious malignancy are shown on the right um, by region and uh, age 0 to 24, uh, cutting every four years. And B um, rate, rate of uh, B, uh, grade B, and yellow and the green, the third, up to third, as you can see, that as you get older, B ratio will increase. And that is what's consistent, it's consistent throughout the exam timing. The, the same uh, tendency was found for the malignancy or suspicious of the malignancy. And up to the third round, as you get older, the uh, suspicious for uh, malignancy goes up. The possibility or the probability goes up. And this shows you the overall result, the O. And for the B scoring, uh, not much difference is what I found. On the other hand, malignancy or suspicious for malignancy, the first round uh, was highest, but afterwards there is a declining trend as uh, the number of uh, rounds uh, goes up. Then the gender and B uh, diagnosis or suspicious of the malignancy or suspicious of uh, malignancy and the people uh, up to the preliminary to third but the two to up to 2005 people and the uh, women was 66 percent to 67 percent and for the malignancy or suspicious of uh, malignancy and uh, it says uh, 110 and 30 is three pe people. Among them, uh, 66 to 58 percent were female. And this is the relationship of with, uh, of the thyroid cancer and obesity. And obesity is often pointed out as an association with the cancers. And the BMI, 85% or higher, are overweight. Is seen as overweight, and the 90% or higher is um, um, defined as obesity. And uh, we check that the uh, association with the onset of the uh, thyroid uh, cancer. And the control was uh, 200,000, and the uh, overweight, 20,000, and obesity, uh, 14,000. And uh, you see that age, gender, and the external radiation doses. Um, with the obesity, the risk ratio was 2.23, which is very high. And even after the adjustment, independent risk factor is pointed out for this group. So there is a possibility of the association with uh, of the uh, thyroid cancer and the obesity. And this is the summary, the finding from the TUE and the relationship between radiation exposure dose and the thyroid cancer. At this point of time, there is no statistically significant dose response relationship. And secondly, the confounding factors association and the participation ratio, ratio of the exam and the age, gender, and obesity are pointed out as a possible uh, com uh, factor for the confounding. Lastly, the current status and the future of TUE. And this is outline of the TUE, the fifth round from 2020 to 2023 uh, till March it was conducted. And currently, 
It is start in the sixth round and started from April 2023. And I talked about the advantage and disadvantage of uh, TUE. This is a voluntary examination. So the the eligible people are uh, people who want to have this examination. And the people who want this examination, for them, for them, we are setting up the system so that they can get the, the examination in a very easy manner. And the general venue, including the evenings and holidays and public facilities, and we would like to make it possible to apply via web so that the convenience is improved for the application. And the currently, in a medical institution, there are 85 uh, in-prefecture institutions and 146 out-of-prefecture institutions. And as of last year, so uh, it is possible to have the examination in these uh, medical institutions. As a disadvantage is that uh, there should be the concern, uh, uh, accelerated concern or anxiety in order to mitigate that. The support team enhancement is uh, now being worked, and we would like to continue to work on that. More specifically, the point is the uh, psychosocial support. Uh, right after the primary um, ex uh, exam, at the same venue, the explanation can be given from the doctor. And the confirmatory uh, examination, if and this, this is the exam uh, that something is pointed out in the primary testing and support team, and also that the clinical psychologist are the members of the team so that the, they can respond to the anxiety of the people at the same uh, venue. And uh, secondly, it is a medical consultation line. So to the medical related question, the doctors are able to respond and answer the questions. And the on-site lectures and the session, and, this, and the, between 2013 and the 2023, uh, it was conducted in 306 sites and also the medical expense support from Fukushima Prefecture. This is the prefectural work. So the financial burden of the medical expenses, as a part of the prefectural business, the support is uh, provided so that the disadvantage of the exam uh, can be uh, reduced for TUE. So last, this is the last slide for this research and the survey, Radiation Medical Science Center uh, doctors and also the staff members at this center have uh, been very supportive. And uh, these are the people who made it possible for me to present this material. And I'd like to once again uh, provide, uh, extend acknowledgement to them. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Furuya. And please uh, raise a question in that the format that I explained. The title of the presentation is Lessons from 12 Years of the Comprehensive Sales Check, Dr. Shimabukuro of FMU to present. Over to you, Dr. Shimabukuro. Good afternoon. I am from FMU. My name is Shimabukuro. Session 1-3, sent lessons from 12 years of the comprehensive health check. Topics. There are three topics. One, lessons from 12 years of the CHC. So uh, I'd like to talk about lessons. 
There has been some uh, changes observed, so uh, topics number two, possible mechanisms, will be explained. And also as topic three, let me share uh, future perspectives based on the health check result. This is how FHMS is uh, constructed. In this study, I will cover um, basic survey and the CHC 1 and 3. Estimated radiation dose and NCD, how they are related with each other. The background. In the basic survey, we have uh, obtained estimated dose of uh, four months after uh, the 2011 Greatest Japan Earthquake. And we um, estimated uh, doses. Uh, we also, uh, the purpose of the study is to determine the relationship between estimated radiation doses and NCD in the resident in the 13 municipalities. The colored area is the designated evacuation zone where we um, measured air dose rate and estimated uh, doses and we uh, those who uh, had um, basic survey were eligible and out of 70,869 uh, we uh, covered 54,087 people and we uh, divided uh, these into uh, these resident into three groups one zero two one one two two and two and over near the sea field and uh, also looked at uh, our onset of uh, NCDs and uh, looked at how uh, estimated radiation dose impact the onset of NCD. Result, out of uh, 28,000 resident, 68%, uh, 25%, and 7% are the grouping result. They make up of 57% so uh, the remaining 47 percent um, estimated dose is not known but we used a method called uh, multiple imputation to calculate the estimated dose of the known participants and later i will show you the details and we also analyzed the basic survey group and no basic survey group and the basic survey group alone. The result, uh, this list for the uh, hypertension, diabetes, and dyslipidemia and other NCDs, and uh, polycythemia, anemia, thrombocytopenia, and uh, lymphocytopenia. Uh, the diseases that might be influenced by the uh, exposure to the radiation. And this shows, this um, table shows that the increase of such uh, diseases uh, in a group of radiation dose of two millisieverts per year or higher. And if the figure is over one, it means that it has increased. And for example, in hypertension, in this group, uh, the figure it increases uh, 1.29 means that uh, the uh, the two millisievert group has 29 percent increase in the occurrence of hypertension and then we adjust the model with sex and age and uh, uh, bmi and evacuation status and it's still increased by 13 percent
And then we adjust it with um, excessive drinking and smoking, and then the uh, impact disappears. And diabetes and others, in model one, increase has been indicated. But after the adjustment with other risk factors, other, fa other factors, it disappears. Summary. Estimated doses were associated with increased hypertension, diabetes, and up to polycythemia. However, the association disappeared after adjustment for evacuation status and lifestyle-related factors. As a result, it is unlikely that the high estimated dose of the evacuees in the first four months were directly related to the onset of lifestyle-related diseases. On the other hand, it is presumed that the evacuation and lifestyle changes have affected the development of MCD among residents. However, there are limitations on the study. The coverage ratio is only 30 percent, so it might not represent the uh, population as a whole. And so another, another limitation is that since uh, CHC was initiated several uh, months after the accident, that might, might not reflect the effect of radiation exposure well enough. And also, uh, it requires longer follow-up. And this study's uh, follow-up period is six years at the maximum. And also, the effect of diet, physical activity, and psychological stress are not considered. Next, uh, let me talk about the possible mechanism. This shows how NCD occurs in general. And the representative NCDs are diabetes and hypertension and IGT, uh, but the, they normally do not exhibit the uh, symptoms. But it would result in the uh, arterial fibrillation and the stroke and the myocardial infarction and the CKD that will trouble uh, them and present an symptoms. The well-known cause, one of the well-known cause is behavioral risk factors uh, such as uh, unhealthy diet. But another factor is uh, at work, for example, uh, globalization, urbanization, and uh, air pollution, for example. Other than that, there are some learnings from CHC for a 50 year older, old or younger children and in this group. A certain number of children presented uh, obesity, uh, dyslipidemia, hyperuricemia, liver dysfunction, and um, hypertension and IDT. And fortunately, obesity improved, however, dyslipidemia among boys persisted. For the population uh, 16 year old or uh, higher, Obesity, metabolic syndrome, uh, IGT and diabetes, and CKD, hyperuricemia, and polycythemia increased. Hypertension and LDL, <sighs> cholesterol, liver dysfunction uh, improved due to the um, therapy and a higher physical activity. And no changes were observed in the white blood cell count and fractions. This diagram shows the an increasing NCD after the disaster and how uh, the uh, evacuation is uh, if, if impacted. And we uh, show the graph with uh, the ones related to obesity, the ones are not related to obesity, 
and uh, it started with the serial obesity, and then it proceeded to uh, high trade triglyceride, high, low HDL, and hypertension, and IGT. And one IGT person uh, develop diabetes, the same percentage of MCD would take place. If the person is not obese, and then CKD might take place, and the uh, hypertension uh, might take place. And I underscored those uh, which have seen an increase in the uh, CHC, uh, for example, diabetes and the metabolic symbolism and IGT, especially among uh, adults. And hyperuricemia uh, is on the rise as well. And for the diseases I have uh, explained, uh, we are now conducting a detailed study, and uh, for example, in CKD. This uh, table explains uh, what, uh, in what group CKD uh, and CD increased, and the red means that there is an increase in the uh, group uh, in the NCD, and downside arrow means there was there was a decrease. Hypertension, for example, uh, increased both of the uh, women and the women, but uh, you can uh, clearly see the association with uh, obesity. In all the uh, obese, um, hypertension, diabetes, dyslipidemia, and liver dysfunction and the CKD had an increase, both in men and women. If the person smokes, um, leanness increase, and if smoking is present, um, this epidemia might increase among men as well as uh, diabetes. Evacuation status might affect uh, dyslipidemia and liver dysfunction, and uh, changes of jobs will increase dyslipidemia and liver dysfunction. Based on the result, what is the future perspectives? Uh, what we can do in order to protect the health of the residents? How NCD occurs at the top? And what we can do as an individual? Not only yourself, but also your family members. First, uh, it's important to keep to healthy lifestyle. You have to uh, get an accurate knowledge of the importance as well, or literacy. Health literacy is very important. What you can do as an individual is quite uh, limited, so it is important to take an action in community, count a country and as, a, as well as the global level. For example, in a community level, you cannot uh, ensure good health if only junk foods are available. So it's important to offer healthy food and offer places and the times for uh, physical activities. Right after the disaster, people didn't have enough opportunity to exercise, for example. It's important to offer place and the times. Also, it's important to create systems to support NCD prevention and care services. On a country level, it's important to offer opportunities for health check and provide research support. 
Our uh, health management uh, survey uh, is expected of these things. So what can we do? What are the evidence uh, for prevention and treatment? If the person is uh, over 50 years old and uh, unhealthy and physically inactive and or uh, if it, uh, the person is adult, it's important to um, overcome, um, the, um, improve the obesity. And to do so, uh, there is no effective medication. It's important to lose weight. But once you have developed uh, diabetes, there are um, specific uh, comorbidities such as uh, diabetic retinopathy, neuropathy, and nephropathy. You might think that uh, losing weight might uh, improve the status of such uh, diabetic microangiopathy, however, uh, it would not. So you have to take medication. There are non-obesity related risk factors you can see at the bottom. Losing weight is not effective for LDL cholesterol figure you need to uh, take uh, medication to improve. To hypertension, losing weight is not effective. You have to restrict salt intake and take medication. This slide uh, lists up the lows of CHC, CHC in 10 years, uh, five major points. I would not go into detail, but it is important to give a feedback to the resident if they uh, take uh, CHC. It is also uh, important to share the feedback with uh, municipalities and what, uh, to identify where the difficulty lies so that they can make an individual approach. To deliver that message to the residents, it's important to have face-to-face -face communications as well. And by such communication, we can uh, reduce uh, risk uh, to a substantial level. However, for the increase of uh, diabetes and hypertension, uh, the risk will grow larger uh, with the passage of time, so we have to take further action. Summary. So what we learned in the 12 years of a complete health check and possible mechanism and the future perspectives. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Shimabukuro, for your presentation. Yes, let's go to the fourth topics. The current issues of mental health among affected people after Fukushima disaster, the importance of human bonds in society. Dr. Horiko Shinaoko, who is the deputy director of the Mental Health and Lifestyle Survey at FMU. So would you please refer to page 24 and 25 for her biography. So uh, Dr. Horiko, are you ready? Would you please begin your Thank you very much for the uh, your introduction. I will uh, focus on, on uh, I will uh, present on Kokokara uh, survey, mental health and also lifestyle survey. 
or MHLS. The topic today is the current issues of mental ill health um, among affected people after the Fukushima disaster, the importance of uh, human bones in society. I will focus on the overview in the past year, uh, in the past part, and also I will focus on the support we are offering from you know, the bond or connection in the latter part of my pre um, presentation. So this is the purpose of the survey, or MHLS. So through the survey, we want to, un wanted, uh, to understand the mental health and lifestyle problems of the people affected by the disaster on a long-term basis. Then based on the health information we obtain, providing appropriate support for their health, medical care, and where we to fulfill their needs, such as reaching out to them by a telephone call. In other, words, in other words, the purpose of MHLS was not only to conduct the survey, but also to provide support. So the uh, about um, 13 cities uh, or the 210,000 uh, residents were covered in this survey based on uh, on the age, we have divided uh, that the questions into five groups, and we have sent this question to individual, not to each family. And this uh, survey started in January 2012, and this is our year 13. The main survey items are that uh, uh, the strength and the disabilities questionnaire or um, SDQ, subject to health, sleep, exercise, and development, and so forth for the children under junior high and uh, school age. And these were mainly answered by their parents, but only junior high school students were asked to answer some of the questions by themselves. For adults, we asked the questions about the general mental health, trauma, medical history, diet, radiation risk, um, perception, and so forth. And also, we included a space for free descriptions. We received over 40,000 responses per year, and we read all the free descriptions as the voice of people affected by the disaster. Now, uh, let me explain the result of the survey. So first is the response rate, how it was developed for, for children uh, in the first year, 63.4%, adults 40.7%. The response rates have been high, but since then, it went down slightly step by step, and 20% below for children now, and for adults, it has been remained at uh, the range of 20%. So we uh, found many uh, voices that they wanted to uh, answer online. So from 2016, people can answer either by online or by paper. Uh, overall, uh, 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 the, among the overall responses, about 30% of children and also 15% of adults have responded online. Next, I want to show you the result of SDQ, the um, um, proportion of children with 16 points or higher. So unaffected people's uh, average was 9.5% for the unaffected area, people living in unaffected areas. Um, um, however, immediately after the earthquake, the rate was much higher for uh, all ages, especially for children aged 4 to 6 at 24.4%. Uh, Since then, the rate has decreased in all age groups. And it has been over 10 years after the earthquake, and maybe one of the reasons of the improvement was we have more children who did not experience the earthquake. Now I want to show the result from the adults. So the um, like uh, feeling depression and also the uh, anxiety, uh, feeling anxiety. We have the people with uh, uh, the risk uh, having a higher uh, risk uh, scores. And 30% uh, that was before the earthquake, and after the earthquake, it went up to 14.5%, and it was uh, gradually improving after that. But in FY 2021, it was increased about 1%, probably due to COVID-19. Next is about daily exercise frequency, uh, almost every day or rarely. So we have four um, um, ranges. and. Um, 
people who uh, exercise often, the proportion has been improved uh, since the disaster. However, maybe because of COVID uh, in 2021, the people who did not exercise, the proportion went up slightly. This is about uh, problematic drinking. Uh, from 2012, we added to this item so that uh, highly likely that people having prob problematic drinking, uh, that, you know, uh, uh, the score, that the ratio has gone down for both male and also female. Next is about changes in the risk perception of next generation radiation effects, like your children or your grandchildren. How much health impact could occur um, by the radiation effect? And uh, probably uh, we had four uh, um, levels. Probabilities are very low to probabilities are very high. Uh, the people who answered probability, possibilities are high and very high have been decreasing step by step each year. Whether they are living in pre pre uh, prefecture or, in, uh, or outside of the prefecture, People who are living outside of prefecture, uh, in their perception, uh, the score was higher. That the, the, they seek, think there is a probability of risk. Next is that uh, if you have any uh, psych uh, mental or a physical problem, do you have anyone you, uh, who you can contact with? And uh, who said yes? Uh, you know, among that, um, the highest uh, who they consulted to, the high, uh, the majority was the f highest uh, answer was a family, then friends, and so forth. But 11% uh, of the people said they don't have anyone to consult with. And who are those people? The people who say yes, that means 11% of the entire population. And they were mainly 40 to, uh, 64 years old male and having economic difficulties and living alone. At the same time, the people who don't have the people, to, uh, the person to consult with, seems like their uh, uh, overall uh, mental health uh, was uh, worse than the people who did have uh, someone to consult with, and they have more uh, uh, um, more people had the problematic uh, um, drinking too. So you know, uh, their social connection is essential to improve mental health. So. Uh, Especially family members in the critical situation, like you know the uh, disasters as well as the daily life. So those are the uh, strongest, uh, the more, most important supporters. And we have done the same survey over the people who don't uh, consult with their family members. The people who don't consult with their family members, com compared to the people who consult with the families, their you know, uh, the mental health risk is 1.33 uh, uh, times higher. So uh, to the affected people, we need to ask them if they have someone they can consult with. At the same time, we need to check with them if they have been able to consult with their families. It could uh, identify the people with high risk scores earlier. Now let's move on to the latter part of my, uh, my uh, presentation. So um, based on the result of the survey, how we are uh, connecting with affected people, supporters, and also, also municipalities, I want to talk about this from the viewpoint of a connection. Number one, uh, you know, we are as our a telephone support based on the outreach uh, approach and we are not waiting for the telephone calls from them. We are outreaching them by uh, making telephone calls to offer support. So the strength of this approach is that it doesn't matter if they want to consult with us or not. Since we are calling them, the people who cannot uh, seek uh, you know, help by themselves, we can also approach those people. At the same time, we understand the situation from the questionnaires or survey. We can um, approach to the substantial problem at the earlier stage and also like the some like a geographical problem. There is no impact from the travel time or travel cost we can offer uh, prompt uh, the nimble uh, support to the people living in remote areas. The support team includes a clinical psychologist and also public health nurse and also the uh, social workers. And uh, and based on, we do the assessment based on the information from uh, the affected people and uh, we can refer other centers as needed and also we can uh, refer them to the uh, regional uh, sources or healthcare uh, facilities, and we have offered this telephone support to 40,000 
people so far. And this is a criteria to select the participants of SQD for children, and also if they have any party uh, person they can consult with, and what was described in the free description space for adults, the overall uh, the, their mental health uh, status and also trauma, uh, sleep, um, drinking, and other information from the free description. And concerning the, um, the uh, telephone uh, support, and we have done the interview uh, for the people living in the temporary ho uh, ho houses. Uh, if that uh, screening uh, uh, efficacy was insufficient, and uh, uh, this was uh, why, because I came to uh, Fukushima from Kanagawa Prefecture. This is I, rem uh, I remember this clearly. So you know that the uh, people who conducted survey were like public health nurses, and uh, I, I'm so thankful that there were so many supporters came from Fukushima prefectures and also other prefectures to offer support and there are some members who are staying here to keep offering support and uh, so the majority of those supporters were uh, for, for their first time to you know visit affected areas so we took them a tour to take a look at the actually uh, uh, affected areas by tsunami and we asked them to uh, bring the uh, map of Fukushima prefecture and also brought a pressure monitor and the map are so useful for the surveyors who were not familiar with the area. And at the same time, they were able to keep um, measuring blood pressure, uh, their blood um, pressure. And at the same time, they were able to offer support and advices to the afflicted, peop um, affected people. And they are specialists, because, uh, the health nurse is a specialist uh, as surveyors. That was one of the uh, you know, uh, positive impact as well. And uh, this is a very large scale question. Uh, survey based on questionnaire, but we have done interviews too, and we were able to have opportunity to listen to the voices of affected people directly about their living status. I think that was a you know, very important experience for us. And also that we have done the outreach telephone support uh, impression uh, evaluation too. The satisfaction level of our support was 74.6% for outreach style uh, approach. And we are supporting about 3,000 people each year. Sometimes people say, uh, show their, showed their appreciation, and some people were mad at us. However, we had limited manpower, but we were able to support so many people because of this outreach uh, you know, approach, offering the telephone support. Now, uh, the connection with the different types of supporters. So telephone support, we don't have face-to-face -face meeting uh, with the people. So we have an opportunity to share uh, the, uh, the information. You know, if we can have a face-to-face -face meeting among us, then it's very diff important to take like, uh, quick action, especially the people who are living in prefect affected by the disaster in prefecture. Now they are spread across the country. So they need to have a good uh, connection with uh, the, the, uh, the uh, public offices of other prefectures too, especially municipalities in the affected area that is a very important connection to the afflicted affected people so I want to introduce the following concerning uh and they need, we need to have municipalities to be uh, to understand uh, affected people, uh, pe uh, our uh, survey, and uh, that, uh, you know, asking their residents to respond. And also, we try to uh, uh, incorporate the um, the intention of uh, each municipality too. And so that in you know, concerning the question about if they have people to consult with, that was requested by the uh, uh, public health nurse from the municipality. And also, we have a communication meeting with affected 13 cities in order to exchange information on a regular basis. And we want to offer continuous support to uh, the affected people having some um, problems. And uh, based on the information we obtained from the telephone support, sometimes we uh, visit their homes too. And also, the article uh, we uh, uh, post in our PL. Uh, Magazines and so forth, and uh, we are uh, uh, capitalizing, utilizing the um, 
accumulated data in the effective way. Next is about the long-term support. And there were people who were able to respond to the, the, the survey for the first time after 10, 10 years since the uh, disaster, too. Since this is a long-term uh, 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 active um, initiative, so that we were able to get responses from those people, too. We still have people who have not responded to the survey. That's our remaining uh, you know, challenge. I understand that they are socially isolated, and they have a high level of psychological uh, uh, stress. So you know, that's why, and as a specific measure, uh, we want to, uh, we are offering uh, consultation support, not only the outreach uh, approach, but also just waiting for the phone call from those people. At the same time, uh, we have a list of telephone numbers, uh, which is inserted into the questionnaire so that uh, they can call those numbers asking uh, seeking for support. And also, we are sending a leaflet and to uh, disseminate health related information and uh, promoting health care uh, to, to take good care of their health. And that um, we are, uh, it's very important to send a message that uh, we really care uh, about each uh, person. This is a summary. The disaster occurred in Fukushima. That's not some about somebody else. So it doesn't matter. And uh, uh, there is a uh, you know, disaster risk in any region. Doesn't matter if they have a nuclear power plant or not. So you know, uh, the uh, affected people said that please do not forget our struggle. So uh, we need to uh, be, be aware of the necessity uh, to be prepared for that disaster in that uh, the, in, uh, on a day-to-day -day basis, and that uh, affected people in Fukushima understand their you know uh, uh, the physical and also mental health conditions are, are recovering step by step. However, uh, we still have 27,000 people you know uh, 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 being evacuated. So um, and we we know there's so much we can do as individual. However, However, uh, we have supported 40,000 people uh, through the telephone support, and uh, that we want to, you know, stay close to the affected people going forward, as well together with the staff members of MHLS. And last but not least, I sincerely wish that uh, the recovery, uh, that the reconstruction and rehabilitation in that affected areas in North Peninsula uh, due to the earthquake as soon as possible. Thank you very much, Dr. Horikoshi. So this uh, MHLS survey. This is not uh, about survey only. Their purpose is to offer support too. And this kind of survey and the support can be applied to other types of disasters too. I think that was a message which was delivered clearly. Next. Fifth presentation in this section about the pregnancy and the birth survey in Fukushima Prefecture, about changes of the spontaneous and the induced uh, abortion in Fukushima Prefecture. And he is also the head of the uh, pregnancy support uh, office. And uh, 20, page 26 and 27 describes more detail about his um, background. If you are ready, please start. Uh, my name is Fujimori from uh, Fukushima uh, Medical University. Thank you. And I'm a director of pregnancy and birth survey. So for this uh, survey and the support for the pregnant woman in Fukushima Prefecture, as that the uh, FHMS as a main survey, for 10 years we have conducted a survey on the pregnancy and birth. Uh, birth. And uh, now as a main uh, survey, it is not, no longer conducted. And secondly, as a follow-up survey, after that the birth of postpartum, four years of postpartum, partum, uh, we believe it is necessary to provide extra support. So from 2011 to 2014, uh, the first round uh, follow-up survey was conducted, and the second round, uh, that is uh, at the time of eight years postpartum, um, and for the um, women who had the delivery uh, after four years of the disaster. And number three, actually, that this uh, survey is for the people who have that the um, uh, note uh, for the uh, 
baby and the mother, but uh, there are some cases that the abortion happened before that period, and in order to supplement that, uh, before they are getting that the mother and child and uh, no group, uh, we have done the survey of the spontaneous induced uh, abortion. Number four, uh, there is a Japan Association of Obstetric and Gynecology, and they have more than 1,000 of the monitoring in the last 50 years. Um, and they were mainly done by the large size hospitals, but uh, uh, we made a request so that in Fukushima prefecture, the uh, monitoring was done by all hospitals. And it is not uh, a part of my presentation this time, but we are uh, conducting this kind of survey too. And as I mentioned, and this slide was uh, shared, and this survey uh, that has that um, part of the detail survey. And this is the outline. And for this uh, um, uh, booklet is provided by the municipality, and the municipality understand that the address of the mother and our center received that address information and using this uh, um, uh, address we uh, send out the questionnaire sheet and the covered population uh, fill in the form or they respond online and looking at the uh, contents for the free comment part and we determine whether the telephone support or face to face support are necessary. And if necessary, then that, that psychosocial support team uh, will take the role. And, and we sometimes connect with some people to the municipalities so that the municipality can directly send that they provide the support for them. And this is the number of uh, those covered population. And the bar graph shows you uh, in and who had a, who gave the birth in the Fukushima prefecture after right after the uh, disaster it went down and uh, there are some declining uh, tendency with, but this is not the tendency limited to Fukushima prefecture and the bottom you see that the national figures and the same tendency is observed. So this um, respond rate, 58% was the respond rate, uh, which was very high in the beginning, but the afterwards it is around staying around 50%. I believe uh, they were very proactive to respond to uh, us the fill in the questionnaire. This is the preterm delivery rate, and the red shows you that the the national uh, average, and the blue shows you that the result we gained from this survey. Uh, it didn't go above the national average. And also the low birth rate infant rate. And the baby who are born very small, the red is the national average, and the blue is the data from Fukushima prefecture. There are some higher area but uh, in general, they are not so different from the national data or even lower compared to the national data. And also the congenital uh, anomalies and birth defect. The blue is a result of this uh, survey. In general, the babies they usually have some kind of uh, abnormal condition uh, for two to three percent of all babies who are born. And looking at this number, Fukushima Prefecture, two to three percent are the range. And uh, among the uh, congenital anomalies, the most of the, the mo majority is the cardiac abnormality. It's about one percent. 
So it is only limited to the cardiac abnormality, and it is um, staying around 1%. And also, this is the mental health of mothers and depressive tendency. So it is not a diagnosed uh, depression, but the depressive tendencies, we measure them with the two different items, and generally, EPDS, edible postnatal uh, uh, depressive um, system, this is usually used. However, uh, the questions were so many, we used these two indicators in this survey, and we asked the mother to respond. Uh, right after the disaster, uh, there was a very high depressive tendencies. The green shows you that it's converted to EPDS. And there is a paper to show the calculation, but after the conversion, this is it. But the, over time, the, we are seeing the declining trend of the people with the depressive tendencies converted to EPSD and the EPDS. And 9.7% on the national data is shown and the people who had the birth, who gave the birth in Fukushima went to went down to the, about the same level as the national average. And uh, um, the top three topics in the free and right section, in the first section, the um, radiation effect was the concern of a uh, lot of mothers, and over time it went down. After 2015, the natural uh, mother's worries, such as the child rearing and the mother's um, concern about their bodies, and those are the um, items that they were worried about, which is uh, quite uh, natural. And the effects on the radiation on fetus and child is described at the bottom. And over time, it is going down, as you can see. And the last uh, tenth year, year 10, uh, it went down to 0.5%. And the follow-up survey, as I said, and the uh, four years and eight years after uh, the delivery, uh, we do this survey. And the people who are covered, and to the responders, uh, we are doing the survey, and the response rate is uh, high 30s to 40 percent. So this is the postcard uh, we do the survey on, uh, and it is a simple format to just give the check mark. And the depressive uh, tendency? And the first year, the uh, year of the uh, disaster, uh, the mothers who gave birth uh, had high depressive tendency, but the 2014 and 2018, uh, unfortunately, year eight had high figures, probably because of the COVID, concern over COVID. Um, and this is a free format answers. And again, the follow-up survey, even if it is a follow-up survey, the people who had the babies in the same year of the disaster and next year, um, the mothers are worried about the impact of the radiation to their children. And next, the basic survey as a part of the uh, basic survey, this is the uh, external uh, re uh, exposure, uh, external radiation dose, and also relationship to congenital anomaly, anomalies. And you see the data of the age and so on, and the uh, uh, weight at the time of birth, SGA, small, uh, small gestational age, so the smaller the, the one percent tile uh, of the uh, lower uh, weight of the, the ordinary weight. 
So in any of these items, there was no correlation to the external radiation dose. So external radiation doses and the congenital malformations relationship and uh, cataract and new neural tube defects, microcephaly are often talked about, but uh, we didn't find any correlation, especially two millisievert or higher exposure. The people who have such exposure, uh, they show no abnormalities or malformations. And this is a summary. The dependence, uh, the, the depressive tendency is going down, and uh, it was 18% in 2020, and 10% after converting to Edinburgh metal, and it is uh, getting close to the, the national average. And uh, people who are worried about the impact of the radiation is going down. Uh, and it was 0.5% in 2020. And follow-up uh, survey, it was going down. And the, there was some increase in the year eight. And probably this is due to the COVID-19. And uh, the doses um, association uh, with the uh, abnormality were not found. And this in our office, so this is the result of the survey we have conducted, the result of the spontaneous induced abortion and the event. So this is the time that, and so what was the outcome uh, when the mothers become pregnant? And what happened afterwards is how you look at this chart. And if it is within this range, uh, it is not significant difference. And the uh, spontaneous uh, abortion rate, it is about the 10 to 15 percent of the spontaneous abortion uh, out of the all uh, pregnancy, and it is about the 10 percent. There was no significant change regarding the induced abortion. Right after the disaster, looking at the Fukushima as a whole, there may be a slight increase, and uh, the mass media was uh, pointing out, but uh, after doing the analysis uh, for six years, and this is a, a month of event, and we do the uh, uh, analysis every uh, three months, and uh, four, at the time of four, there is a periodi periodic uh, uh, characteristic. So every year, uh, there is uh, it shows you that there is a certain amount uh, you see the increase every year. And uh, uh, for this, uh, you can say this as the uh, gest gestation, uh, meaning the May has particularly high rate of the induced abortion. There is no specificity in, in terms of the uh, increase. But and there is a likelihood the periodicity result um, uh, overlaps. It's overlapped with the earthquake incident. And uh, actually, I've been using the same slide um, since the time uh, just after the disaster. So this is the safety discussion cannot always lead to the security of the people's mind. So we would like to um, disclose the objective um, and scientific data so that we can show uh, the people that Fukushima is safe. Um, thank you very much for your kind of attention. Uh, Dr. Fujimori, thank you very much. Uh, from this survey and uh, of this uh, uh, pregnancy, and there was no impact on the, the babies, but uh, there is a tendency of the uh, depression. But after 10 years, it went back to the normal level. So 
the depressive um, tendency continued for 10 years uh, in a, and that was very uh, something I learned at this from this presentation and if you have a question uh, please um, enter your question up to 25 uh, 12 25 then based on the questions uh, we would like to ask the presenter to answer those questions Thank you very much. Now, allow me to start the discussion session one. Let me invite the chair, Dr. Shimura and Dr. Ohira. First, uh, let me thank you for your uh, co uh, sending so many questions. Since there are so many questions, uh, let me pick up the questions that were asked by more than one people and also the questions that seems to be highly relevant to the discussion. I'd like uh, now uh, Dr. Ishikawa uh, to take the questions. There are so many questions about uh, evaluation of internal exposure dose. The current status of internal exposure, how to evaluate them, and how to evaluate internal exposure going forward. And uh, another field that attracted a lot of question is about uh, food. Thank you, and thank you for the questions. Uh, how to evaluate the in internal uh, exposure in thyroid? Uh, e there is one pa page in my slide deck that summarizes how to. Uh, one thing is the behavioral record in basic survey and also uh, what we got done in simulation, uh, the radiation uh, condensation in air and water. By analyzing these indicators, uh, you can uh, exposure uh, absorption to thyroid and uh, exposure taken by food and water. Regarding the evaluation methodology, what seems to be most reliable is the figure right after the disaster which accumulated in the thyroid. Uh, you apply the dosimeter to the thyroid and evaluate. That evaluation is considered to be most reliable. However, uh, we have the data of only 1,000 resident measured by that methodology. So that's the direct method, and we also have our own method and compare the result and confirm that they both produce a similar value. Then uh, we are now somewhat confident that our method is applicable to larger population, and that's why we decided to use the simulation and behavior record method. Your question, uh, the other popular question was about the food. As you mentioned, inhalation of air and uh, route by water is also uh, considered. And regarding the food, um, the accident took place in March, and uh, not so much uh, vegetables were in the market that were grown outdoors. So it's hard to evaluate its impact. And the most important thing is the most important, uh, most reliable measure is the direct method. And also, uh, the result is somewhat similar to the other conventional method. 
The report is also published as an academic paper. It's peer-reviewed. And therefore, I am confident that uh, our method is somewhat reasonable. That's it from me. Thank you. There are some restrictions in the sample, food sample that you were able to obtain, right? Yes, that's right. I forgot to mention that that's another important point. Oh, I forgot to mention. Uh, I forgot to mention though. Okay. Uh, next, uh, let me ask questions to Dr. Furuya. So uh, let me um, ask the question to Dr. Furuya. Estimated dose data and uh, titled cancer risk data. You presented these two data. How did you consider the uh, internal exposure dose in these items? Thank you so much for your question. I fully would like to answer. The case control survey I conducted in and presented in the presentation for internal exposure, uh, we take samples from the uh, tap water 14 days and of the accident and other method. And for the external exposure, we apply the uh, co collection factor of 1.1. And estimate the radiation dose, and that's what I used in my case controlled study. So you use, uh, you also consider the estimated internal exposure dose in your case control study. Okay, thank you. All right, uh, then I'd like to ask uh, questions uh, to Dr. Shimabukuro. Uh, one of the popular questions was NCDs, for example, hypertension and the association with uh, radiation. Those was the, your topic. In hypertension, uh, when our age and sex is adjusted, then uh, the um, occurrence of hypertension is significantly higher in two millisievert group. However, after adjustment of its lifestyle, the association disappeared, you said. Could you elaborate on that? For the groups uh, with the exposure of 2 millisievert or higher, how does it associate with the higher instance of hypertension? Thank you for your question, uh, such as uh, hypertension and dyslipidemia and uh, diabetes, and the group showed a higher incidence. That's very important. And on the other hand, evacuation status and increasing uh, drinking and smoking behavior, uh, when these factors are adjusted in the model, then the uh, association disappears. That's what the statistics shows. And we, I understand that we still be careful in interpretation of this data. But the important point is the, the dose of 2 millisievert or higher is not the factor. The factor is the fact that, that they had to evacuate as a result of possible high dose of 2 millimeter, millisievert. I am not 100% sure that this is the determinant from a scientific viewpoint. But although I can say that it is not of statistical significance, we cannot completely rule out the possibility. 
That's why I consider that we have to continue looking at it carefully. Thank you. At the moment, uh, you can um, deny the association after a uh, model adjustment. However, the impact of the evacuation and uh, those uh, on NCD need to be monitored in an extended period of time, right? Yes. From here, now uh, may I direct uh, the questions to Dr. Horikoshi, who conducted the MHLS. Bef what are the actions uh, that the municipality and the government uh, needed to take before the disaster hit you? Thank you so much for your question. Uh, it's about the general readiness, and each municipality has the disaster plan already, so I interpret you, you ask uh, what else they, they can do. Uh, uh, we've got accumulated data, but the, the, the data regarding the period after the disaster. We understand what is the number of evacuees long term, but uh, desirably, um, you have to capture the mental state of the evacuees. If you know the status of mental health um, of the resident before the accident hits you, then you can compare a pre and a post disaster status. Unfortunately, we didn't have pre disaster mental health data, so we had to rely on nationwide database. If we could if you could um, pay attention to uh, mental health status data before the disaster, that would help you if in the event of the disaster. Thank you so much for your response. Um, MHLS actually started after the disaster, so it, it's post impossible for you to compare uh, pre and post disaster status. So you can say that uh, those are having mental issues on the rise and depressed on the rise, however, you can cannot compare and contrast it to the pre-disaster status. So it's important to measure it periodically so that you can use the data uh, when an event occurs. Thank you. Thank you so much. Well, next is about a survey for pregnant women. Dr. Fujimori, there is a question to him. So the, survey, the result of the survey among pregnant women, so in the beginning, response rate was 58%, but in the following period, many cases, it was below 50% or even in the range of 40%. So remaining people who did not respond, you don't have the data of those people. Okay, this is a question about the issue of representativeness. The data comparing with national data, if you just focus on the 50% of the data you have, maybe this is going to be pointless. The people who, like, why don't uh, you don't get the data from the all uh, the healthcare institutions within the prefecture where people deliver babies? Thank you for the question. When we started this survey, we wanted to focus not only on the survey but also support. That was that right uh, uh, the goal given to us if we do the uh, in a survey among the institutions healthcare institutions we won't be able to take care of individual pregnant women that's why we wanted to use uh, you know, um, the system to distribute questionnaires so that we can get the answer from each individual so that we can offer necessary support to them so because of that we decided to take this approach so the respondents it was uh, around 50 percent of the total uh, people we sent a questionnaire to. But as a response rate of uh, the survey, I think this is a relatively high ratio. That's my personal view. 
Uh, why, we don't, uh, why we don't conduct like 100% survey covering all the uh, healthcare institutions? Uh, we did not talk about it. There is a society of um, uh, gynecology. And they have they have done the um, in congenital diseases, and we ask them in, in Fukushima Prefecture we did 100% a survey, and uh, as you uh, asked, the questionnaire was sent to each uh, healthcare institution, and uh, uh, the questionnaire was uh, con uh, the survey was conducted among everyone or the or the pregnant women. 100%. And I have seen the interim result of the survey. There was no uh, increase in abnormalities uh, spec specific to pre uh, Kushima Prefecture. That's all I was able to I, I was able to confirm that today. And as we as we discussed today, uh, like you know the uh, abortion and also uh, uh, this uh, miscarriage of a baby, we were not able to cover in my presentation. But we have done the survey among uh, healthcare institutions, the number of uh, pregnant women, and also abortion and also. So mis, uh, miscarriage, and uh, 60, about 60 uh, healthcare institutions within Fukushima Prefecture, and the collection rate was 100%. That's all from my side. Thank you very much. So apart from uh, FHMS, from the another uh, survey from uh, covered all the healthcare in institutions, so he answered based on that background. So going back to Dr. Ishikawa again. Okay, I want to ask him a question. I want to share the question to him. So first of all, the basic survey, the external exposure dose, the assessment on that, is it reasonable? Is Was it appropriate? So appropriateness, appropriateness of that uh, radiation dose um, assessment or estimation. Do you have anything you want? Uh, you can comment, Dr. Ishikawa. Thank you for the question. So uh, external dose assessment method we applied in basic survey. Again, a peer review. Uh, uh, we have already publicized a scientific paper, which was reviewed, reviewed by our peers. So the method was appropriate. That was uh, uh, written in the paper after peer review. So scientifically, it was appropriate. Appropriate. So that's my view. That's the first point. The second point is. With our method, we used behavioral uh, record and also that the airborne dose. And we have the map, and based on the actually measured the air, uh, the um, ambient dose, and we have used both um, pieces of data to do the assessment. We have another me me method like Unscare. So air uh, dose, not the actual uh, dose measured in the air, but the uh, radioactive substance which was accumulated in the soil. And use that and they have used the calculation method using both pieces of data and also like a behavior or activity patterns those are all of those were used to analyze the uh, external radiation dose and our um, result and also unscares um, those estimate we uh, adapted different methods to do the assessment however uh, roughly i mean most mostly it was appropriate or it was uh, aligned so we did not identify any uh, major difference so uh, theoretically as a methodology it was um, appropriate that's one point and also unscare used the method and compare, comparing to their method, we did not find a uh, 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 big um, difference or a, a contradiction. Contradiction. I have a follow-up question. In Unscare, internal radiation dose and also that how many the dose in the thyroid uh, in a, um, a gland dose, I think that was also evaluated and we got a lot of questions too. I understand it was not covered in your presentation. Maybe you won't be able to give a clear answer to that, but do you have any view on this? Thank you for the questions. There is an overlap with my earlier answer. 
But the method we used, and we have that behavior record we got from the basic survey, and also that the measured dose in the air or water, we used both pieces of data in order to um, evaluate the internal dose. At the same time, most reliable uh, data, we think, is that accumulated radioactive substance in the thyroid gland, direct measurement method, and we did not find a big difference. So those are, uh, those results were more or less the same. Com uh, using the average data from municipalities and distributions, we did not identify any, any big difference. So our method uh, was somewhat inappropriate. So that's our view. That's all. So, um, my, my sincere apologies, but we won't be able to take questions from the uh, uh, venue. So um, uh, our sincere apologies. Next, Dr. Huruya. About the dose and also the uh, odds ratio between the, the dose and also that the thyroid gland cancer. You know that uh, you know we have seen that like you know um, that it was uh, uh, increasing. You said that there is no significant or that the uh, strong uh, relationship between those two. But what do you think about the data you presented? Because it has been going higher and higher, and uh, maybe it's difficult to for you to answer. But I want to ask you. Uh, thank you very much for the question. So, in the case of the control study, I presented a con an equivalent dose in the thyroid gland, three mil, a sievert. Um, and also the between 3 to 12 and over 12, there were three groups for the, the uh, study. So 3 mil sievert odds ratio was one. It was, you know, it looks like it was a flourish, but looking into the details for three, between 3 to 12 and also like after over 12 mil sievert, maybe there is an increase, but the answer is there was no um, um, remarkable difference from the or significant difference from the statistic viewpoint. So that will be my uh, key answer to your question. But we do need to do, you know, prudently work on this. So concerning that, you know, we have adjustment uh, factor and adjustment was made using that factor in this result, but as it was covered in my presentation, like gender and birth, uh, date of birth, and also examination uh, of frequencies, how many times they uh, had the examinations. And uh, we are using all the information we were able to obtain in order to analyze this. So I am repeating myself, but based on the analysis we have done, there was no like a significant difference from the statistic viewpoint. Uh, in the, about the confirmatory uh, like uh, survey done, like regional difference, and also that the difference in uh, cytology and the cases are number of cytologies conducted. Was it adjusted? Actually, there are other factors which uh, can impact the result result of the survey, but those are the, uh, you know not, uh, factors which we cannot adjust. Then we are treating those as unadjustable factors. And but going forward, uh, we are going to further discuss this, and I think that's needed. So we would like to uh, further, con uh, you know, um, work on this going forward. So you have shared the data as of today. So th that was the interpretation um, based on the data we have. Thank you very much. And going to a question about CHCHC. This is a question to Dr. Shimabukuro. Chernobyl, really, uh, after the accident of the nuclear uh, power plant and that uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, the more people having diabetes, not only the change in lifestyle and also the change due to the exposure to radiation, uh, is that was it uh, taken into consideration? Thank you very much for the question. So Chernobyl, uh, you know, uh, a nuclear power plant, 
in years it was observed, it was an increase among the people living in that region. And as a result, there was a change in lifestyle. You know, of course, we need to assume there was a lifestyle change and also the change due to the uh, exposure to radiation, to including major uh, na uh, natural disaster. And it's obviously uh, it increases. For example, there was a big earthquake, uh, hit earthquake, and that uh, there was an increase in the same data too. So as I showed you today in our data too, so that we have more, we have seen more diabetes. So the uh, prevalence increase rate increased. So we have there was uh, the same data obtained. So maybe if, uh, the question was if it was impacted by the radiation dose. Of course, we don't deny the possibility from the beginning. The possibility was into uh, taken into consideration in a uh, survey too. So two million uh, sievert and above people with the dose. So without the adjustment, there was an increase, but the impact from evacuation, and if you adjust that based on that, then uh, there is no difference. So the impact from the evacuation was an, a big uh, influence. So, and I think that can ex explain most of that. However, as it was in your question, can we deny it completely? I think that was a point of question. And of course, such impact, we did not ignore such an impact. We want to do more research, and as of today, we did not identify any core of the relationship between those, so we want to see this from the long term perspective. Thank you very much. And the additional question the stress, impact from the stress can be seen as an onset of the diabetes. But the, in this survey, have you um, done the research between uh, the relationship between that diabetes and stress? It is quite important point on that the total society level. Uh, not so many st uh, studies have uh, done the research on the, the relationship, but uh, we have uh, the major finding. If we follow up the patient for seven years, um, we see the tendency of increasing the diabetes uh, for the evacuees. And what's interesting is that uh, between women and men, the men only shows the increased stress, and that tendency is not observed among women. So along with the evacuation, the stress, in, there is an um, um, uh, impact of the strength, and uh, that is, and the men are more receptive for that. And the reason for that, and generally speaking, and women have more stress. That is the uh, known widely among Japanese and also known Japanese. But what we are thinking is that the uh, uh, women feel stress more and can respond to that. But uh, for men, it is uh, difficult to show they have a stress, even if there is a questionnaire survey. And uh, when they say there is a stress, then the seriousness is really uh, high. So is that should be affecting the result of the men having more stress. And uh, because of the stress, the overeating and over drinking, and that which can lead to the diabetes, is what we are seeing, and that is our assumption. And thank you very much for that. And next question. And Dr. Horikoshi, a uh, uh, question for you. Uh, like you do the survey, when you provide the support, the securing the people who provide the support, uh, if you pay special attention to that, um, please share with us that the securing that the um, doctor who provide the support. Um, in the beginning, uh, I wasn't involved, but I hear it was very difficult to have the doctors who provide the support. In general, uh, in and out of the prefecture, uh, there were a requests given to the medical institutions, but the and the um, personal network was prioritized and the acquaintance of those um, network and because of the um, personal connections. 
We could invite the external people to provide the support. And afterwards, uh, if it is within uh, limited to within the prefecture, we don't find so many uh, people uh, who can uh, provide the support psychologically. So we had uh, uh, many external support. But a few years ago, we finally came to the stage that we can manage the people from, uh, from Fukushima. But the public health nurse and the psychologist are specialists. They are specialists to people, but the right after the disaster, the providing the um, telephone support, the fatigue of the um, people affected and the anger are uh, often expressed over the phone. And to the anger that uh, um, brought to them, and they have to respond to them as a professional. And those um, uh, support provider had a high level of stress. So of course, we have to be mindful of the support to the uh, affected people. But it was also important to provide the support for the doctors and the health care professionals. And, uh, we had some encouragement among the peop, uh, peers and the doctors, and uh, also the opinions that the uh, the anger is not to uh, them as the professional, but the general anger came from the disaster. Yes, even though you want to provide the support, sometimes uh, you can get accused from the people you want to save, but they can be a, um, your personal view. But how can you keep the motivation? Is there any suggestion for that? The motivation for the um, telephone supporter uh, that supporting doctors have to get together so that uh, um, they often talk about the issues. And that's uh, very contributing that the higher motivation, not only the anger, but as I presented uh, through the phone, and sometimes they say, I was so glad that you listened to me. And the words of appreciation are often expressed too and for from the evacuees and that is also contributing to the motivation so the the people are providing the telephone support is doing um, the job for a long time i think those are the factors um, really encouraging the continuation of the job and this is the question to dr fujimori and the and there, uh, the, there is a conclusion. There is no relationship um, with the uh, exposure, uh, radiation exposure dose, and also a congenital anormality. But it is not um, widely known. Why is it? Is it difficult to um, distribute or? Um, send this kind of information for the non-relevant target. And, and uh, because we confirm uh, the no, not much difference from the ordinary people, we could uh, confirm much um, difference. But the postpartum uh, depression trend is going down and to the level uh, equivalent to the national level. So in the initial stage, we were focusing on that the support to the pregnant woman. And since we could confirm that the support was provided, and so we ended our program after 10 years. And why it's not well known? After the disaster, I think it was a sixth, uh, sixth year or seventh year, up to that point, uh, five locations in Fukushima every year, I and the secretariat visited did and talk to the uh, public health uh, nurses, 
and also the midwives and nurses, and we asked them to get together. And uh, with such audience, we reported the result of our survey. And uh, uh, annually, the, uh, we, uh, we have a training course uh, for the um, midwives and uh, public um, health nurse. And the, starting from that occasion, uh, the, the no change of the congenital anormality was reported even outside of the uh, prefecture. And uh, um, that type of uh, reporting in the media is uh, going down recently uh, because it was all well known. But in the, the journals, we've been reporting that continuously. But uh, since this data shows no change, uh, that may not be, and that may not cause much interest among the people. And that's all for me. And thank you very much. And since we have some time left, uh, we would like to start the third round. And the uh, question to Dr. Ishikawa, uh, for the all um, people in the prefecture, how do you do the feedback to all people in the prefecture, the result of your survey, and uh, how do you plan to uh, disseminate the data going forward. And it is uh, like a public, uh, the, the promotional related the question, the feedback to the people in Fukushima, the individual feedback or for the all people in prefecture, uh, there may be a two aspect for the individual. Uh, in my presentation, I, uh, as I said, to the individual, uh, we are uh, giving the information about the uh, doses that we measured. And for other feedback uh, for all people in the uh, prefecture, uh, uh, we are reporting the result to the working group. And for instance, in this working group, the media comes and do the uh, interview and also the doses distribution is uh, introduced at the Fukushima newspaper and the distribution uh, per municipality was uh, put on the pages of the newspaper and this is one of the ways that we are giving the feedback to the general public. Uh, another thing, how useful is it or the result of our survey? Uh, for instance, uh, to give you one example, uh, what I heard um, is that the one person, a certain person, and when there was an explosion of the nuclear plant, he, he or she was outside. And he, he or she was uh, very concerned uh, um, because of the exposure. But the, in the basic survey, uh, based on that the um, behavior, we are uh, doing the estimation for the doses. When at that, that what time uh, the person was outside and uh, uh, in what condition. If you, um, they can give us that information, we can give the estimated doses sent back to them. So if someone is concerned, then uh, the um, those information can be sent as a feedback, uh, as a scientific feedback. Uh, for instance, uh, I don't, I don't know if I went through the basic survey. Or I don't know. I'm not sure about the doses. And there may be some um, individual issues or the questions. How do you respond to that? And thank you very much. And the basic survey is also ongoing. And therefore, uh, the contact or the uh, door is open. And if you have any question, you can always contact or call the call center then uh, we can send out their questionnaire sheet. So if there's something, and the, our door is always open.
We still have some more minutes, so let me uh, direct the next question to Dr. Furuya. Uh, thyroid cancer and including the, the suspicious uh, Thai uh, gland and the cyst that we collect uh, FMU, uh, uh, that we call it FHMS. Uh, there are some other uh, thyroid cancer cases, and how do you get uh, that data reflected in the uh, whole? As you see, yes. There are thyroid cancers detected outside of FHMS. Based on the possibility in the case control study, uh, we uh, also added uh, cancer registry registrants. Uh, this is a nationwide registration system uh, which uh, records the data of cancer patients uh, all throughout Japan. And that data is reflected in the study that I presented today. And still there are some uh, missing cases, but I'd like you to understand that uh, we have already made an uh, utmost effort to sample uh, titled cancers. To um, analyze causal relationship between radiation and thyroid cancer as accurately as possible. Okay, uh, the answer is that they, uh, we have made a utmost effort. Okay, now time is up. Let me close this session. Every year we have uh, this international symposium to take your questions uh, while presenting the new data, latest data. And going forward, we will keep in touch with you, continuing explanation. Thank you so much for your participation and attention. This is the end of this session. So this concludes session one. Let's acknowledge that based on the volume of questions submitted, three days, even three hours would be better than 30 minutes. But be assured that the questions that are written down follow us back to Fukushima. And if at subsequent events our presentations get a little better, it's because of the people telling us what they want to know. And we, we act on those questions. So thank you very much. Now, Ms. Tsuchiya. Dr. Nolet, please go ahead. By Dr. May Abdel Wahab, chaired by Professor Tamaki Tomoaki. Their biographies on pages 33 show extensive international experience. Professor Tamaki himself was working at the International Atomic Energy Agency when the Fukushima nuclear accident occurred. He subsequently joined FMU in 2015. Dr. Tamaki, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, my name is Tomoaki Tamaki. I will be chairing the session of this keynote lecture. Today, we have an honor to have our keynote lecturer, Dr. May Abdel Wahab of the IAEA, the Director of Division of Human Health, Department of Nuclear Sciences and Applications of the IAEA. Um, she is an extremely busy person with a lot of projects and tasks internationally, and although she is uh, connecting to us from Vienna, Austria. Uh, we are very uh, fortunate to have her presence here online. And she's, we all also appreciate that she's accommodating the time difference between Japan and Austria. And I believe it is um, 6 a.m. in Vienna. And thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. Abdul Wahab. Uh, can you say just a few words to greet before I sh uh, introduce your bio biography? 
Thank you very much, uh, Professor Tamaki. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Friends and esteemed colleagues, can you hear me well? Yes, we can. Yes, good. So friends and esteemed colleagues, uh, Professor Tamaki, Professor Yasumura, Professor Oto, and President Takanoshita, we are very happy to work with Fukushima Medical University over the years. We have worked for since 2013 uh, together on uh, science, technology studies, and many other areas. The efforts and the uh, excellent uh, programs that have been set up have been a pleasure to, to uh, collaborate in. And, and congratulations on having this important um, meeting and conference because this is, it's really important, again, for communication. Most of the talk will be regarding um, how to communicate to each other um, as human beings so we can, we can deliver the information, understand um, each other, regardless of our backgrounds, whether it's scientific or not. And I think that uh, the, the, the collaboration has been extremely important. I have um, uh, been lucky to uh, meet and work with many colleagues and the people of Fukushima uh, who have been uh, inspirational. And, uh, and today, um, I wish I could be there myself, but soon, uh, hopefully, um, I will be able to uh, return and, and, and be together since we are initiating uh, new collaborations as well. Um, I wanna thank you for organizing this, this conference again, and thank you for the, the kind invitation. It's always a pleasure. Uh, so with that, I won't take too much time. I'll hand back to uh, Tamaki-sensei. Thank you, May. Um, um, I would briefly introduce uh, the bio biography of Dr. Abdel Wahab. Uh, she is a radiation oncology with, uh, oncologist with an experience of over 30 years uh, of experience of patient care, teaching, research in the field of radiation oncology with the specialty in the treatment of prostate and gastrointestinal cancers. Um, she has served as a member and chair on various national and international committees, including the United Nations Joint Program on the Cervical Cancer Prevention and Controlling, Control Steering Committee. Um, she has also led the development and implementation of IAA Science Technology Society projects in Japan, Asia, and Europe to educate medical doctors in radiation risk communication. Um, she is currently co-leading the IAA Rays of Hope initiative uh, in a task force aiming to improve access to radiation medicine globally through on the ground support to centers, research and innovation and sustainability through anchor centers. Uh, she, her extensive experiences in research, education and international cooperation is shown in the page uh, 32 and 33 of the program. So please uh, take a look. Uh, with that, um, we will have pre-recorded lecture of Dr. Abdel Wahab to be secure about the uh, broadcasting on site and also online. So after the uh, pre-recorded lecture, she will also answer question and answer sessions. So we, with that, I would like to start the pre-recorded lecture. I'd like to thank Fukushima Medical University uh, leaders and organizers for the invitation to speak today. So uh, the areas that we'll cover is a general overview of radiation exposure, how patients uh, are concerned with uh, radiation effects and how they process information, radiation risk assessment and communication. And then we'll talk about the STS projects, which are the main uh, topic today. And then finally, how the next new STS projects will integrate with Rays of Hope initiative.
Now, an example of proper communication may be as follows. So if you look at this uh, nice infogram, you have a dose scale that shows millisieverts. And then on the right-hand side, you had natural background radiation examples. And then on the left-hand side, you have artificial radiation, and like medical radiation, for example. And so if you tell someone that a certain medical procedure uh, will give them a certain number, uh, a certain amount of millisievert or expose them, then um, it's not as easy to understand. However, if you tell them that it's like a Tokyo to New York flight, then it becomes much easier to understand. This is another example of the same kind of concept. So here we can say, we can put it in terms of the time to receive equivalent background radiation. So for example, if you get a head CT, you, it would be the equivalent of eight months of regular exposure to background radiation. And this puts things in context. If we look at the anatomy of the brain and the standard functions as we know them, we see that the parietal, frontal, occipital lobe and cerebellum and their functions, both motor, sensory, and otherwise on this slide. However, before we go deeper into the communication realm, we must look at the human brain in a developmental way as primate, mammalian, and reptilian brain, or even the new cortex, middle brain, and brainstem because this classification ties into how we communicate. And when we think of the human brain, there's several levels. If we think of the neocortex versus the middle brain versus the brainstem, each one has specific functions. And unfortunately, in a situation where there is fight and flight response, it usually comes from the lowest part of the brain, which is the brainstem area. So the neocortex, the thoughts, the meaning, the logic, go out the window. And we have to remember this when communicating so we can communicate to the person in that state. The level of health literacy cannot be assumed since it varies by socioeconomic status, culture, language, age, ethnicity, education, perception, cognition, but it should not be overlooked since health literacy affects the health outcomes. Why? It can affect access, it can affect utilization, it, no, uh, no doubt about it, colors provider, patient interaction, and self-care. So we know that there are gender-specific differences in doctor-patient communication. The differences, is not, the differences are not in how much biomedical information is provided to the patients. However, the patients of female physicians provide more biomedical information to them than to male physicians. And this may be related to the type of questions asked that stimulate the patient to disclose more. Communications should be kept brief and simple. So 27 words total in print media allows for a quote. Nine seconds for TV and radio media allows for a soundbite. And you have three key messages. That's all the public can process during a high stress situation. So this is a very good example about some of the background behaviors that happen during medical encounters. So you have, as I said, culture and doctor-patient relationship, personal characteristics of the patients and the doctors, and characteristics of the disease itself. Is it a life-threatening disease? Is it something that's chronic and can be managed? All of these um, affect the, uh, are variables that affect communication. But also, uh, what is the content of the communication? How advanced is the patient's illness, for example? We have to describe that. How is the relationship level with the doctor that's giving the information? And so forth. And then finally, the patient outcomes would be either satisfaction or compliance. So it actually has an impact on the outcome and not just that the patient feels better after leaving the, um, the encounter. The message that I'm trying to give is that communicating risk is, should not be avoided if it's operated properly. We can educate and inform the public and the patients outlining the whole picture. 
and allow them to voice their concerns and uh, with better communication, this can be achieved. So affected people obviously need reliable and accessible information very rapidly. And a significant difficulty is, is talking about effects and risks of exposure given the uncertainties and limits of knowledge. So we need to let people um, know the differences between science and judgment, and above all, to understand the individual's values and choices. Um, we should try to have established places for dialogue. We should try to rapidly implement projects to address the problems that were identified. And this is an example um, of what was done before since 2014 with a series of projects that we have been involved in to, to address some of the issues that were identified at the time. Um, in addition, a common language should be used and uh, not too much medical jargon, for example. We also have to evaluate and disseminate any results we have. And develop practical radiological protection culture. And this allows the population to make choices and behave wisely. And one example of this is the current project that's looking at returning the returning population to low dose areas and how uh, they can self monitor in certain area in certain um, scenarios, etc. So when we think of risk communication, it is a cycle. So we go from risk communication systems to internal partner communication and coordination, then, then to public communication. But really important is engagement with the affected communities and communicating with them, and dynamic listening and rumor management. And then it feeds back into the risk communication systems. So why is this important and why do we need to uh, improve communication? Well, ineffective communication results in negative consequences. We know that. We can easily communicate the technical facts, but and in some situations, the safety information or you know individual risk. But in order to truly close the communication gap, we have to think differently. And this will allow us also to increase public trust in whatever official announcements come through. So there's an intersection of uh, policy, of science and of uh, the capacity to do this. Now, the risk communication systems that I was talking about takes into consideration several factors that we know. And one of them is that the audience, audience's interest um, is taken um, at, to heart by the source and that the source recommendations are grounded in factual information and that the source of risk communication is more knowledgeable about the risk than the targeted population. Of course, that's not always the case. Other areas that we see um, you know, a change, for example, in terms of communication is the uh, media attitude change towards nuclear power in the wake of the Fukushima disaster, not only in terms of the sentiment, but also in terms of framing and it shows a long-lasting effect that does not appear to recover before the end of the period covered by this particular study that I show here. But not only the media, but also in terms of residents' risk perception, we see that exposure doses <clears throat> have not uh, changed. The gap between the perception and exposure doses has not changed, even seven years after the accident. And so for further recovery of Fukushima in the existing exposure situation, specialists in radiation health sciences must continue their efforts to communicate with the residents to narrow this gap between the perception and the actual exposure doses. So what about uh, new technologies, especially with COVID-19? We have issues with face-to-face -face, um, visits. So the use of telemedicine has expanded significantly. <clears throat> and that's one area where we wonder whether communication can be effective. Is it inferior? And this particular um, source noted that the patient satisfaction of telemedicine versus in-person cons consultation seemed to be quite considerably similar. 
to, um, to in-person consultation. With the patient-centered communication, it was quite high. With, you know, with the clinical competence, it was quite high. Interpersonal skills, the same. Convenience of care, as expected, of course, in-person was less convenient. But it shows us that we can, do, we can achieve good communication even using telemedicine. So we can have a medical exam and a physician visit where a patient starts out as empowered and leaves disempowered. And that's not what we want to do. So we hope that we don't go down the spiral of lowered patient expectations, unvoiced frustration, and so forth. And in the end, it affects the quality and it declines. Um, so there are certain things that we can do to improve the outcome. So like a welcoming ritual, uh, being present, which is sometimes difficult when people are trying to type on the computer and so forth, but also uh, choosing positive words, uh, nonverbal communication is extremely important, and many others, as you can see on this list. All of this enhances the patient experience and understanding. So it's, it's complex uh, in terms of communication, but it leads to worse results if we're not careful, and we need to be aware of all these factors. Finally, I want to very quickly go over some of the IAA uh, activities in STS projects and the expertise within the IAA. So we have Department of Nuclear Applications, which has expertise in human health and radiation, but we have others, also nuclear application, that has um, IEA environmental um, uh, experience, uh, radiomics, and so forth. We have um, experience in soil and water and, and, and so forth. But also nuclear safety, where we have the Incidents Emergency Center, we have waste management, and other groups within the house that also work with us. However, the cost and throughput differs when we're trying to measure. So for example, whether it's a high cost, low throughput um, government-based labs, or a single uh, detector that could be also low uh, throughput and low cost, but also uh, high throughput um, opportunities, as you see on the right-hand side, which can be either low cost or high cost. So one example of the complexity is, uh, as you can see here for an average, uh, this is a CRP uh, or research project through the IEA, for a dose that this snake got, for example, is very different because the, the uh, behavior is different. So it adds another level of complexity to when we think about exposure. So in this case, it's on the tree, it's on the ground or in the ground and very different outcomes. And now just to mention some of the IA activities and reports that were published, I'll go through them very quickly. Here you see a few related to response, emergency preparedness, implementation of effective actions, many things that were learned and developed after a Fukushima accident. At the time, there were many actions in terms of cross-checking monitors for radioactivity levels, in water and air, exposed to the accident, all the way through uh, current where the IEA just it confirmed the third batch of off-treated water in November and continues to engage in this area. You see some more examples of the IEA response in terms of workshops and even a international conference on lessons learned 10 years after the Fukushima Daiichi uh, accident. The STS approach is the interdisciplinary field, and that is very important. It's not only the scientists, but also society studies and technology evolution. We look at it within the social, political, and cultural contexts. So for example, if we have nuclear accidents, we noted in the past that the crisis of expertise in the overdiagnosis of what the effects can be and the public health crisis can easily arise. When we want to communicate, we have to contextualize the information and be able to have a single source that's trusted and be able to weed out extraneous information. 
And here we see examples of the STS projects all through the last one year extra budgetary project that happened. And you can see that there were many technical meetings and others that happened during this time. The large network across continents can be seen here, and we hope to continue to increase the participation from different countries. On this slide, you can see the broad international network. 50% of uh, participants were from Japan. However, as you can see, Europe, Asia, and other countries, other uh, areas were um, participating as well. The diversity of professionals was not only in terms of uh, where they, uh, what country they originated from, but also from the specialization. So you can see here the number of science and technology studies experts, the number of medical and health sciences experts, and the number of nuclear scientists as, as we move along, all of them working together within this project. If we look at the specialization from another aspect and divide it into humanities, natural sciences, and social sciences, you also see the diversity that is very clear in the participants. There were training workshops and technical meetings, and even when COVID-19 happened, we were able to continue virtually. There were poster sessions and young investigator sessions that supported young investigators from Hiroshima FMU and other universities, as well as the Phoenix program students. And here you can see some of the training sessions as well, some of them supported by QST. There were many outputs through this project or the, the series of projects. And uh, among these are handbooks, and some of them are uh, jointly with social scientists but also with nuclear safety colleagues and so forth. So it was truly a, a multi-dimensional approach. Here we see the nine IEA publications that were published and examples of uh, presentations on the FMU site. So there was a plethora of uh, useful tools and information that was shared. It's important to also note that curriculum development was an important part of the project. FMU instituted curriculum change based on STS methodology. Nagasaki University initiated a new master's program and Hiroshima Phoenix Leader Program cooperated extensively in the STS projects. The changes that happen can be adopted to university and postgraduate education in other continents as well. And this has been a very important uh, outcome related to this project. So now to introduce you to the next project and the next phase, we have to present a little bit about Rays of Hope, which is a project by the IEA that hopes to leave no country behind. Because right now, half of cancer patients need radiotherapy, and many of them do not have access in access to cancer around the globe, especially in radiotherapy. In most developed countries, access to radiotherapy is taken for granted, but the picture is very different in many developing countries. On this map, you can see the worldwide availability of radiotherapy machines according to need, and you can see that Africa and Southeast Asia face the largest shortages of radiotherapy technology, shown in red, orange, and brown. We estimate that 80% of Africa's 1.2 billion inhabitants have no access to radiotherapy and related cancer services. And this estimate is based on data from IARC and IAEA. And it assumes that 50% of patients of, with cancer will require radiotherapy and that one radiotherapy machine can treat 500 cancer patients per year. If we look at the difference in equipment per million population between 2013 and 2021, where this was evaluated and reported, we see that most countries around the world had an increase in their equipment in low middle income countries. There were uh, very few that had decrease in equipment. 
However, this did not catch up with the increase in population and number of cancer cases, which went up uh, significantly higher than the increase in the uh, machines. Not only that, but there is a gap in human resources in low middle income countries. The total number of additional professionals needed would be almost 13,000 radiation oncologists, 6,500 medical physicists, 3,200 dosimetrists, and 20,000 radiation therapists. You could see that in Africa, we'd have to increase the number by 200%. So why are we uh, t touching upon rays of hope? Well, the reason is because the new project, the new SCS project will include rays of hope. And uh, we have many opportunities for collaboration, not only through the SCS projects, but through the practical arrangements with FMU, through the fact that we have a collaborating center agreement with QST and High Care, and soon to be announced hopefully anchor centers with uh, Japan. So to those who are not familiar with Rays of Hope, it consists of three main pillars. The first is to support access through technical assessments, buying equipment, and capacity building. As you saw, there's a need for training. The second pillar is sustainability through regional anchor centers, as I mentioned before. The third one is through research and development and innovation. The reason innovation is important is that so that we can train people better. We can use new technology like virtual reality that was developed at the IEA or other technology to help physicians become better physicians and train more efficiently. STS communication has an important role in this training. Generation of data through innovation and through the databases at the IEA will help us support the world in understanding the gap and the need for treatment and cancer management through radiotherapy and other nuclear applications. So for example, on the right hand side, you will see in blue that radiotherapy global innovation index was minus 1.4 and minus 1.3, meaning that this is an alarming trend that cancer cases are outpacing the available technology. This cannot be done without these databases. In addition, the anchor centers that I mentioned before for sustainability are going to be a very important uh, tool or for us to be able to uh, train people from the region in STS through the education and training opportunities. And they will also support research quality assurance technology and equipment um, in the region, training on equipment in the region. Already the IEA has um, has uh, signed with five anchor centers, and you can see them on the map, but several others have applied, including anchor centers from Japan. So the anchor center is a knowledge hub for radiation oncology, radiology, nuclear medicine, and medical physics in the respective region, and will support capacity building through training of IEA fellows, hosting inter-regional, regional, regional or sub-regional training events and provision of experts, including field expert missions, lectures and training courses pertaining to the region, and so forth. They will also support IAEA coordinated research projects in design, implementation, and follow-up. They will also provide training in clinical trials, design, and implementation and they will support quality assurance in the region. They have a very important role and will be a vehicle for us to be able to train in STS and communication. A new project will be initiated shortly to continue the good work in Fukushima and address radiation risk in society and issues related to medical treatment of patient, 
including those through the lens of the Rays of Hope initiative. The scope of the current project is basically to train and apply radiation knowledge for medical personnel and uh, improve communication skills related to radiation exposure, as well as to focus on the current conditions and what's going on on the ground in the population, uh, including uh, with the regional stakeholders. So finally, in conclusion, we have success, successful risk communication looks at, number one, the in, uh, effects of risk perception, and we tailor the message according to the person's background. It's really important to understand how patients, um, as well as the local population, view this information, process the information. And one efficient way to improve communication uh, between the concerned population, patients and doctors is through education and very importantly interpersonal skills training. And that's one of the things that that kind of training was done within the STS projects. Finally, I'd like to thank our colleagues in Fukushima Medical University, Hiroshima University and the Phoenix program and Nagasaki University, as well as QST for uh, supporting the training during the STS projects and the government of, of Japan for supporting the STS projects. We look forward to working together and moving the STS projects forward and supporting uh, the population and improving communication. Thank you very much for the invitation to speak today. Uh, thank you very much for the... Thank you very much for the presentation. I think that the um, the lecture by um, Dr. Abdel Wahab touched on starting from the basics and uh, including the mechanism and principle of uh, communication with patients and with the communities, and also expanding to the uh, introduction of IA activities on emergency preparedness and responses, and also cooperation with Fukushima uh, Medical University, including many of the projects and activities under the practical arrangement. And also, um, Dr. Abdel Wahab introduced about the, the new project of the IAEA, which is Rays of Hope, to promote uh, radiation medicine uh, worldwide. Um, Thank you very much for the presentation. Um, Dr. Abdel Wahab, can you hear? Yes, I can okay. hear you. Can you hear me? Um, there, um, one question from myself. Um, you presented this uh, concept of communication uh, with patient physicians or uh, physician communities uh, context and what do you think is the application of what you talked to the uh, population-wide survey or uh, health monitoring such as the Fukushima uh, management survey that we are conducting? Thank you very much for that question and, and it's a very um, you know, important question because how how are we connecting some of the work that was done in communication um, and STS techniques in what in what was presented today? Um, I think the data that uh, that that was presented is extremely important, but whatever um, data we have or that's produced through. Um, various surveys or research or other uh, types of <clears throat> um, fact-finding, basically, doesn't mean anything unless it is well understood. And communication has always been an issue for humanity in general, whether it's communication because of different cultures, languages, uh, just experiences in life, and so forth. So our interpretation of what's being said can be very different. So in order to reach the, the goal of, of, of understanding what is happening and of supporting 
people in general, whether it's our patients, whether it's the general population, because general population, because um, a lot of times physicians are the link to the many groups in the general population. Um, any of these areas, it's really important to be able to have a very clear understanding. So if I'm a technical person, a scientific person, perhaps you know, I will speak a certain uh, way and have certain and use certain terms. And then you, you have a person who may be a, a, you know, a teacher or a, a kindergarten teacher who has specific questions and wants to know the data, but might not, under, you know, unless we all speak the same language and understand how to communicate better, the data, the hard work that's been done in collecting the information through the survey and other things will go, will, will not reach its potential. Um, so, so that's, I think everything is linked and it's all related to how we communicate to each other to be able to have a clear idea of what the other is, is saying or presenting. Without that, you have misinterpretations, you have mistrust, you have a lot of things. And in, in your daily life, just in living as human beings on this earth, there are many examples that each person around the table today can give of times where they did not really uh, understand something or somebody misunderstood them. And it's because we don't speak the same language. So STS is extremely important in being able to bring the different uh, ways of thinking and concepts in a way that the information can be shared. I hope that's helpful. Yeah. I, I, I think you stress the importance of being on the same ground despite the differences in the background and knowledge level and expertise and so on. Thank you. Um, I would like to move to some of the questions that we received from the audience. Um, the one of the questions touch on the study that you showed about the Kawauchi village, about the perception, risk perception towards the one milli uh, sievert um, among the residents that it has the, the risk perception is still high and has not changed uh, during that period. How do you think these could be approached and remedied? Hmm. Challenging it's a good question. question and it's, yeah, it's a challenging question. And, you know, um, sharing data is, is important, but also um, being able to describe and communicate what like the first um, one of the first slides that I gave is is comparing things that we normally do every day, like flying, for example, or uh, background radiation in certain areas. Uh, if you we had we had <clears throat> at one point through the STS projects, we had a couple of people from different areas in the world. Uh, one of them was uh, was a, a place in India that's known to have a high background radiation. And, and they were describing ways how they understood what this, what, what this meant. So again, you know, I can't emphasize, there's one thing about the measurements and the science and the numbers and also very important to the self measurements because people would like to have control over this. So examples are the de-shuttle um, uh, work that was done in Fukushima and others. Um, that gives people the ability to, 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 to measure and have control of what's happening. Um, that's one thing. But then once we have all the numbers, the interpretation is even more important, the understanding of what it is. And I think there's more work that needs to be done in this area. Thank you. Um, there's another question regarding the, the community's trust uh, to the experts, I believe. Um, there are many instances uh, in this question shown in the Zoom that such as the bikini, uh, the instance in Bikini uh, Islands and also the bombing of Hiroshima and uh, Fukushima, which caused in a way the distrust uh, towards experts. Um, I believe that 
especially a person from the IAA is considered to be an expert, and how do you uh, deal with this distrust from the public? So actually, I think that that um, is not really my area of expertise. As you know, we're part of the medical um, you know, group within the IAEA. Um, but the one thing that I can say is it's very similar to physician-patient uh, interactions. And the only way that that could work is that if we're able to reach, reach out to our patients and discuss the facts on the ground and, and then the other thing is empowering patients to be able to make their own decisions and, um, and you know, call the data, get the information themselves, I think, and then make a decision. I mean, I think, I think the time of having experts, uh, you know, give information and that's it is, is that's, that's, that's centuries like this, like go back to at least one century. I think now uh, people can actually measure for themselves, look for themselves, investigate. The average person who comes in for treatment will have gone through a lot of different uh, websites and various things and, and so forth. With that freedom, of course, comes responsibility. And the responsibility is for the person who's online uh, Googling and finding information to always look at the source of the information and make sure that it's a reputable source and so forth. But I think, again, it's a partnership. And I think it comes not just from experts talking to others. Um, and these experts can be anything, as you know. So you can, you can be... Uh, and experts in one area, let's say a, a cardiologist, but you might not understand, let's say, radiotherapy. So expertise is, um, is a general term because there are so many subsets of experts and don't, they don't necessarily uh, understand. One, uh, we, I, I know that uh, uh, Fukushima Medical University and others, as I said, have started um, increasing the number of hours for education on radiation uh, through the, the programs that I had mentioned in the slides. And all of these have been very helpful, of course, in, in allowing medical students, the next generation, to have the skills to be able to communicate better, but also understand radiation. So it's interesting that even in the experts, in the medical experts, not everybody has the same access to specific training. And, and so, I would say that um, it's important not to you know, lump people into silos because experts or non-experts, it depends on what area, and it's a kind of broad spectrum. And not only that, but we have to remember that everybody, um, experts or not, are individuals and people. And and uh, with their own uh, knowledge level in certain areas, with their own background. So I think the, the, the idea is a bit more complex than you know, the silos that we like to uh, put, you know, think of because it makes it easier to, to, um, to understand the world around us. Well, thank you very much. Um, well, the, we consider that the cooperation uh, between uh, Fukushima Prefecture uh, residents and also P Fukushima Medical University with the IAEA is, is extremely important and beneficial, especially for the activities in the future. And we hope to continue this uh, with the agencies and with uh, you from the Division of uh, Human Health. Uh, thank you very much again uh, for your contribution to this symposium, and we would like to uh, send the best regards to you and to the agencies. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the invitation to speak today, and thank you to all the uh, people who are listening as well to, to spend time and, and learn more about this. Appreciate it and appreciate the collaboration. Have a good day. Thank you. I think that will conclude the, uh, the session for a keynote lecture. Thank you very much. Thank you. So thank you, Dr. Tamaki and Dr. Abdel Wahab. Now back to Ms. Suchia. Now it is time to start the session two.
the bridges to the future for the people. Nolet Sensei, uh, Dr. Nolet, please. Chapter 13 2 Bridges to the Future for the People. This session will be chaired by Professor Tsubokura Masaharu and Associate Professor Mizuki Rei whose biographies appear on pages 36 through 39. Beyond academic scholarship, both session chairs have extensive experience in person, on site, with people affected by the 2011 earthquake, tsunami, and nuclear crisis. Subokura sensei Mizuki-sensei, dozo. Thank you very much. Session two is the bridges to the future and for the people. And Tsubokura and uh, Rie Mizuki are leading this session. And uh, I'd like to invite the presentation from three uh, prof uh, professors. And uh, uh, Uchiyama Tokio, or Professor Uchiyama Tokio, whose uh, biography is, uh, is on page 40. And also, and he is the professor um, in 1958, after graduating uh, the uh, Juntedo University, he is uh, working as a uh, pediatric uh, psychologist, and he's working on the mental health of the children. And after, right after the disaster, he's working with the children with a developmental disorder, and he is uh, he, he is now uh, our vice president of this university. Uh, thank you very much. And thank you very much for your kind introduction. And thank you very much for this occasion to speak in front of you. Uh, I would like to extend my uh, gratitude to uh, the faculty members of the Fukushima Medical University. I'd like to talk about the psychological effects on children in Fukushima and their care. And right after the disaster, and there were some rumors, uh, many rumors after the uh, disaster, and someone was saying that the, it is likely to see more uh, children with a developmental uh, disorder. Um, what we uh, resume that the uh, infant health check early just um, after the disaster. I wanted to share with you the data accumulated from that and from the public health nurses uh, from Hamadori, they mentioned the, relent, uh, the, the restlessness and the hyperactivity observed uh, in children. And uh, by collecting the data of the infant uh, health check, I started to do the analysis. Uh, in March 2011, um, there was an earthquake. And after that, uh, starting from that uh, year, we started uh, the uh, health checkup. And actually, the 2009 uh, was the starting day, uh, year of the one and a half year old health checkup, and the uh, three and a half health care uh, checkup started in 2011. And starting from uh, 2018, uh, we started the questionnaire survey with the elementary school. And also, we have conducted a survey with their parents and guardians, and this uh, survey, uh, 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 after this is surveys, we are providing the follow-up checkup. So therefore, uh, we have combined the support uh, in association with the survey result. And as you know, Hamadori, this area, is that the location of the Fukushima uh, Daiichi nuclear power plant. and here. After the uh, disaster, uh, some uh, people were uh, needed to evacuate to other locations. And this is the uh, survey of the one and a half year old health checkup. At this point of time, uh, this is the time of the disaster. And uh, this is the one and a half years old uh, health checkup. Before the disaster, it was uh, uh, 500 to 600 people, um, children got the um, 
uh, checkup and the Right after the disaster, the number of children went down, of course, and gradually it was coming back. There are many items in the health checkup, so I cannot introduce everything. But the uh, one distinctive one was the other than the mom, pop, uh, do they speak a meaningful word? Um, the people say yes, are indicated in this graph, and also and point of uh, something that uh, knows about the picture book and pointing the picture book uh, meaning the joint attention so especially the social aspect of the children of the development development of the social uh, and the, without this uh, uh, behavior the autism spectrum risk can be ex can be questioned. So that can be the case without the pointing. And without the pointing, we don't have, uh, regarding the pointing, we don't have the data from the uh, before the, the disaster. So 10.6 uh, is the highest. And this kind of move, what does it mean? It is difficult to determine that because the, 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 uh, the total uh, children who received the uh, survey are very different but uh, uh, and the pointing is which is an indicator of the communication and the social aspect and the 6.8 percent are not able to do that and the, compared to that it is more than the double but after that it goes down and again it goes up so it is a very uh, strange movement and uh, this is checked by the public um, health nurse. But uh, as an indicator, uh, the real reliability may be low. So it is the difficult part to determine. And this time, uh, this, this is a result of the responses by the parents and guardians about the children's behaviors. And if uh, they have the uh, impulsiveness or the hyperactivity and uh, nighttime crying. Nighttime crying is increasing and also the hyperactivity goes up again. And the uh, impulsiveness at, in the year of um, disaster, it was very high, but the goes down gradually. And after the disaster, how children change uh, are observed in some places, but the, what's common worldwide is that the children with the hyperactivity can go up, and that, that was observed in Hikushima and Amadori, Hamadori. And the mental situation of the, the parents and the guardians and there were questions regarding this. And right after the disaster, and the children, child care is fun, it goes down, and but coming back. And uh, the frustration is uh, uh, claimed, but it is going down. And this is a movement we see. The next, uh, I'd like to share with you the result of a three and a half year old health checkup. Uh, actually, there are uh, some parts that the public health nurse fills in and parents fills in. And uh, by public health um, nurses, and the children cannot say their names, went up uh, all of a sudden and with the peak uh, of uh, in, in uh, 2013. And also, um, I was expecting uh, the children with the impulsiveness, but um, it went up slightly, but went down. And also, uh, the poor eye contact went up, and but immediately goes down. So depending on the item, um, there are things that goes up immediately or takes a while to go up, but uh, cannot say their name in full at the age of three and a half years ago, compared to the pre-disaster, uh, there is a high percentage. What this means is that it's not easy to say what this means. And still, I'm searching if there is a correlation to anything else. And also, this is the response by the parents and guardians. And 
And uh, in case of the parents, the poor eye contact is very rare, but the impulsiveness or restlessness goes up after the disaster. And looking at this, the, the children with the restlessness was high. And um, from the public uh, health nurse, uh, poor eye contact was high, but not by the parents. Uh, probably uh, parents did not pay attention whether the children had the high eye, eye contact or not. However, the public health nurses are trained people, so they are checking the eye contact. And uh, after uh, the uh, disaster, it went up, but coming back. And also that the impulsiveness and the restlessness and the by a guardian, parents, and the public nurse, the trend is about the same. Uh, therefore, I believe it can be a highly reliable data. And, and from uh, the, uh, 2013, there's a time lag. And uh, we are uh, seeing gradual increase uh, right after the re-exam. So, the number of um, um, children uh, is changing too. Now we are seeing the increasing number of children coming back. And also that the condition and the behaviors are uh, changing. And also uh, we have children moving in from other places too. So it is uh, difficult to uh, you know, draw the conclusion immediately. And uh, based on that result of the infant health um, checkups, and uh, uh, we were seeing the language development issues at the time of uh, one and a half years old. But the three and a half years old health checkup, increase of children with the issues of restlessness, language development, and the, the acquiring the daily living skills. Actually, uh, we haven't been able to do the full analysis yet. We are just getting the data so far. And why? Um, the, we see the increasing number of children cannot say the full name or the, pay, the children with the hyperactivity. And there are 500 items and the, we are checking. Uh, we, we try to see the correlations, but the, we haven't really finalized the result. And how long this uh, incident or tendency con uh, continues? And uh, uh, right uh, um, uh, uh, while after the um, disaster, COVID started, so it uh, makes the uh, interpretation more difficult. And then the school age, what will happen to them? And in the future, when they grow up, what will happen? That the uh, hyperactivity uh, will hyperactivity continue or not? And also. Since we are the clinic, in that clinical area, how we can act? What kind of advice should I give? Should we give to the school teachers and parents? Or uh, something that we are uh, considering? And uh, let me briefly cover the questionnaire survey on the elementary school uh, student. Uh, we conducted that in. Uh, from 2019 to 21, I talked about the one and a half year old and three and a half year old. Afterwards, they become the elementary school students and the junior high students. And we targeted, uh, we um, focused on that the second graders and fifth graders. And so what happened to that the following uh, uh, health checkup, it was difficult. Uh, we have a data. And regarding the elementary school children, it is the voluntary uh, response. And so it was uh, difficult to collect the lot, um, high percentage. And uh, if uh, the data we were able to tie with the uh, with that the uh, infant data, we had uh, 139 cases for second graders and 100 cases with the fifth grader. And the uh, second graders, which were surveyed uh, from 2010 to uh, 12, uh, they were born and they um, uh, experienced 
uh, the earthquake from prenatal to one year, and the fifth graders, they experience a disaster from a one to four years old. I was wondering uh, whether um, we can find the differences of the impact depending on the year of the disaster. The method is a multiple logistic regression analysis we adapted. What we surveyed was uh, um, gender and uh, age and SDQ. And there's a questionnaire. And this is uh, the global standard. And we have used that uh, method. And also, uh, the higher the score, the support uh, needs is higher. And also, a K6 was used to check the mental condition of the parents and guardians, whether they have a depression or anxiety, and also the uh, health-related QOL, SF8, and SF12 words were used, and also the child uh, rearing of environment and also the uh, disaster situation or, or Oh, sorry, the evacuation situation at the time of disaster. And also the uh, understanding level of the words and also condition of the parents were considered and to find out the correlation and the results. The second graders, TDS difficulty. So whether the child has a high needs of the support and if there's uh, any concern about the behavior of the child. And with that um, child, what are related? What factors are related? At the, type of, at the time of a three and a half year old health checkup, uh, we found that emotional issue and also and the sense of um, well-being by the parent was low and they are still uh, on evacuation, under evacuation. And these are the factors which could impact the behaviors of the sec uh, second graders. And actually, what was uh, 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 in distinctive was that, that impact found in the three and a half year old continues still to the second graders. And also, the environment is impacting uh, a lot. Uh, they are still on the ev evacuation. And this is the fifth graders uh, result, which was unexpected. At the time of uh, three and a half year old the checkup, and the, uh, the sometimes parents said they are not providing the enough support. And it was uh, seven years ago. And the parents felt the lack of um, support. That is impacting the behavior of the fifth graders. And also the uh, lack of support from others or surroundings are impact, is also impacting the behavior of the fifth graders. And since we are the pediatric uh, psychologist, we are paying attention to the words and the behaviors. However, um, parents think the lack of support, and that uh, is has some impact on the behavior of the children. To summarize, at the time of disaster, and now uh, compare the two different timings, SDQ uh, impacting factors, and for the second graders, that the emotional issues at the time of three and a half year old health checkup and lower sense of the well-being uh, of a parent and also long period of the evacuation life. And for fifth grader, at the time of th three and a half years old health checkup, the mothers feel uh, she lacks the support from the surroundings. So as um, to summarize the result, as a challenges in the future, and the parents and the children in needs in high needs of the support at the time of elementary school, uh, we need to intervene in an early stage because they are uh, they have high needs of uh, support. We should uh, intervene with them early earlier stage. 
and uh, what kind of support should we provide to the mothers who need the lack of uh, support? And this is not uh, clarified fully yet, so we'd like to work on this. And also in this region, and uh, support and resources uh, very scarce. So how we can provide the support, we should think about that and uh, set up the system to provide the support. For that, uh, we should um, be able to identify the parent and the child in needs of support. Uh, because our resources are limited, uh, we have to be able to identify them. And, uh, and uh, currently, uh, it is we find it difficult to link between the uh, infant health checkup data and the data from the school age. And uh, in order to identify that, what type of um, parents and child needs, what type of support uh, is something that we need to clarify going forward so that we can deliver the right support for the right recipient. Thank you very much for your kind attention. And thank you, um, Professor Uchiyama. And parent support is uh, uh, very important. That was a strong message, I remember. So we'd like to get the questions later on. Then uh, we'd like to go to the next um, uh, presentation. The second speaker is uh, Mr. Yoshinori Katahira. After graduating from Chiba University in 1980, uh, he joined the Fukushima prefectural government when the East Japan, Great East Japan earthquake <coughs> hit us. He was uh, in uh, cash um, control a department. After he left the prefectural government, uh, he joined Fukushima Collaboration uh, Revitalization Center, uh, engaging, being engaged in wide area evacuee support. Now, he uh, continued to uh, support the wide area evacuees as the governor and of Fukushima Collaborative Revitalization Center. Over to you, Mr. Katahira. Good afternoon. Thank you for your kind introduction. My name is Katahima of Fukushima Collaborative Revitalization Center. Uh, I'd like to uh, talk about uh, how we support revitalization effort as well as uh, wide area evacuees. Uh, first, uh, what are the topics I will cover today? First, uh, I'd like to talk about the Fukushima Collaborative Revitalization Center. And then I will talk about the support for wide area evacuees. Then a consultation a program result. Item number four, things we can tell from the changes of the consultation details. Self-introduction. Uh, I'd like to skip over it as the chair kindly has given an uh, introduction. So Fukushima Collaborative Revitalization Center. Maybe this might be the first time you've heard about it. So before going into the uh, contents of the presentation, let me uh, go over what it is. History of establishment. After the uh, Great East Japan earthquake, a number of organization, private organizations, started activities in the prefecture. But 
Uh, most of them were uh, focusing on uh, individual uh, need support, and there was no intermediating mechanism. Of course, it's important to respond to individual needs, but also it is important to connect the dots or connect the people based on the need to uh, connect the people. We launched the, the organization Fukushima Collaborative Revitalization Center. We define our uh, vision as the Fukushima vision uh, that is to uh, for various groups to deepen their collaboration and to working work to prevent and solve ongoing problems. What I have just touched on in diagram. On the left. So the challenge is that the tree was triggered by the nuclear power plant accident and a number of organizations are needed to get aligned. There are other challenges such as demographic challenges and isolation from the communities and society aging. And the issues are becoming more and more complex because of the uh, effect of the uh, disaster. Uh, we define it as the vision with the aim of establishing a mutual collaborative civil society Fukushima. There are three programs that programs that we cover. One of them is coordination for disaster affected people. Under this program, we help the people in Hamadori to reconstruct their livelihood. This is a picture of uh, Futaba, where eight uh, municipality got together last month. Second program is nurturing reconstruction support members as well as community reactivating cooperation squad, community leaders. The picture shows how we conduct training courses and onboarding courses. Alongside with these programs, we also offer consultation and exchange program in support of wide area evacuees. Together with reconstruction agency that lead program to support wide area evacuees. Under this program, we set up a support centers all throughout Japan with other local organizations. And let me, from the next slide, let me go into the details of uh, support for wide area evacuees. But before doing so, let me once go over again the situation of the uh, disaster and the nuclear power plant accident. On March 11th, 2011, the earthquake uh, hit us uh, with the epicenter of the coast of Sanliku with a magnitude of 9.0, the largest uh, earthquake on history, on the recorded history. 
giving a devastating impact in eastern Japan. As a result, uh, typical the Fukushima uh, first uh, power plant lost external power. As a result, radioactive substance release risk went up. The government uh, declared a state of nuclear emergency and issues instructions for evacuation in the nearby residents. To, on the following day, there was an uh, evacuation order issued for the uh, resident in a 20 kilometer radius. Some of the residents outside of the evacuation zone also uh, felt anxiety and wanted to evacuate. The situation of the evacuation the number of evacuees peaked in May in 2012 to 164,000. They evacuated to all uh, a variety of places all throughout Japan, and 62,000 people evacuated outside of the prefecture. The number of evacuees fell after that, but as of November 2023, uh, 20,558 still stays in an evacuation place outside of the prefecture. In response to the situation, uh, the, we collaborate with the prefectural organizations who dispatch the supporters uh, all throughout Japan and set up support centers in 26 places. So that the evacuees uh, can rely on the support centers when they feel uh, necessary. Information is also provided by these support centers. The consultation and exchange program, uh, as we call it, are set up, as I mentioned, uh, support centers in 26 places. Most of them are aligned with NPOs and other private organizations, taking care of the request from the evacuees. The program started in 2016, holding um, exchanges between the evacuees. We also have some uh, sub-centers uh, in the centers. Most of the uh, supporting organizations are private organizations such as NPOs, but uh, some of them are concerned with specialist bodies uh, such as Certified Public Psychologist Association or Social Workers Association. Now, let me to go over the details of the request that uh, we received. This is the number of uh, the requests we have received, and its trend between uh, 2016 and 2018, uh, it trended around 1,800. But since uh, the fiscal 2029, it's on a declining trend. Uh, in January 2020, uh, the pandemic was uh, broke out. As a result, we became unable to uh, set up a face-to-face -face interaction uh, event, and then the uh, state of emergency declaration was made. 
then it's even hard, it was even harder to host such an event. As a result, up to uh, fiscal 2022, it's on the declining trend. Request the trend by age group. Age are 40. 40 is the largest age group uh, at, the, at first, which used to account for 30%, uh, declined to one third in the six year period. On the other hand, the 50s, which includes, which accounted for around 15% at the beginning, has more than doubled. Likewise, uh, the 60s and the 70s and the 80s have increased which means that the older people now accounts for higher percentages. Some of the long-term service users has turned 70s from the 60s or the 80s from the 70s. Then let's look at uh, uh, request categories by consultation contents. At first, the most popular uh, consultation content was housing, and the likelihood accounted for only 10%, but this livelihood content is on a constant increase. and has more than tripled to 34% in 2022. It seems that the changes in the life stage and uh, uh, aging uh, with the prolongation of the evacuation has highlighted the livelihood issues. Then uh, from here, allow me to pick chronologically up major concerns expressed by evacuees. The first year in 2016, a lot of inquiries and the requests were made regarding housing. In 2017, uh, housing related concerns were expressed from uh, by evacuees from the designated areas. Also, this was the time when a rent-free period was lifted. Relevant requests were uh, often made. In 2018, a number of requests was made by uh, evacuees who seemed to have a mental health issue. In 2019, Uh, since the uh, temporary housing problem ended, uh, uh, um, request related to relocation uh, request was often uh, made. And for the last couple of years, uh, quite often the requests were from the uh, older people who are in difficulty because of the aging. Things we can tell from the changes of the consultation contents. As we have chronologically uh, looked at um, the changes are somewhat made by the uh, end of the support measures and the changes of the lifestyles of evacuees. And with the passage of time, uh, the challenges faced by evacuees shifted from um, 
evacuation specific topics to livelihood related topics but there's one constant topic that is uh, isolation uh, from the community and all of them are combined uh, making the challenge more complex for the evacuees uh, there are a number of reasons that isolate uh, evacuees from the local community. After the disaster, it might be hard for them to reconnect to community uh, once the ties are lost. If they are isolated, uh, their difficulty might go unnoticed and it's hard for them to speak up, even in the difficulty. And uh, the elderly people and those with mental health issues um, might have difficulty in accessing the right information and to reconstruct their livelihood. Therefore, it is unrealistic to expect that all the evacuee can access a necessary government service without difficulty. Also, Since the uh, issues faced by the evacuees is quite complex, it is hard to uh, be addressed by a single agency or organization's effort. We might to combine multiple agencies in addressing the challenges. Multi-layered support system development project uh, initiated by the government. The project was launched as the new project reflecting uh, revisions of the Social Welfare Act. So summary. Latent problems of a local community may surface because of the loss of support from uh, community functions by the collapse of the communities due to the earthquake. That may cause various difficulties in resolving problems at the place of evacuation. The framework for various types of collaboration on a regular basis is important. As to creating that framework, multi-layered support system development project and the disaster case management movement are helpful. We have been involved in the support of wide area evacuations caused by the Great East Japan earthquake and the nuclear disaster. We believe that we must take lessons from this experience and disseminate what we have learned for the disaster preparedness. We anticipate that another disaster might happen, for example, the Great to, uh, Metropolitan Area disaster with the direct epicenter business. So it's important to uh, prepare for that uh, uh, the regular uh, other peace time. Thank you for the opportunity. This is the end of my presentation. Thank you, Mr. Katahira. There are a number of evacuees spending their time outside of the prefecture still. The changes of their needs and the status, and we are reminded of the importance of continued uh, support for them. Thank you. Okay, let's move to the third presentation from Dr. Tamaki Tomoaki. So the uh, presentation title is Risk Communication and Support Activities of Radiation Medical Science Center for the Fukushima Health Management Survey of the Affected Municipalities. And he is a professor and chair of the Department of Health Risk Communication, FMU, and also director of Office of Risk Communication at Radiation Medical Science Center for FMU. 
HMS2. My name is uh, Tamaki Tomoaki. And three, uh, today I will talk about the risk communication and support activities of radi uh, Radiation Medical Science Center uh, for the Fukushima Health Management Survey for the affected municipalities. So the objective of Fukushima Health Management Survey, or FHMS, is that the external dose evaluation, uh, uh, which was caused by the, uh, yeah, the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant. At the same time, we want to ascertain the health status of our people in Fukushima Prefecture so that uh, you know they can uh, take uh, receive treatment as soon as possible. At the same time, we want to promote the better health of uh, the people in the Fukushima Prefecture for the future. And we have uh, two pillars in this uh, FHMS. One is a survey and also support. Uh, through survey, we want to have a, you know, a precise and uh, accurate understanding on the status in the, in, uh, of the people in the, uh, the Fukushima Prefecture. And also that we want to understand the needs of the residents in Fukushima. And at the same time, we want to offer a strong support so that they can maintain their good health or the health status. In the first part of my presentation, I will focus. I, uh, uh, no, earlier today, there was a presentation focusing on the result of FH and S as well as the support. But in my presentation, I will focus on the activities in order to offer our supports going forward. So this is about the basic survey. Uh, this is a rep uh, going to be a repetition, but in this survey, uh, we focused on uh, we covered a four month period after the uh, accident, and uh, based on the behavioral record of the residents, uh, we have estimated external uh, radiation dose. So important point is for all the to the respondents. and we notified the result of our estimate uh, dose estimate one by one giving accurate information on that dose to each in individual so that that can be used for them to manage their health and going forward next is about the comprehensive health check or chc Due to the nuclear power plant accident, uh, many uh, people have to evacu evacuate, which uh, uh, gave a major change to their uh, living, and they had uh, many of them had anxieties concerning their health. That's why we have conducted CHC. Through this um, CHT activities, we uh, want to understand that health status of the residents so that uh, they can uh, receive medical uh, care support as soon as possible. And uh, all the people who uh, took CHT, CHC, the result of the health check was notified um, person by person. And also the summary of the result of CHC and also the leaflet to promote better uh, further health. And including those pamphlets, uh, we have distributed this information to the wide uh, range of audience, uh, the residents. Number three, all the uh, people who uh, received the CHC and uh, we put together the report uh, based on uh, the, the report we got from each municipality. So uh, we have a, th uh, a liaison meeting among 13 um, municipalities uh, of which were affected uh, by that accident. Then uh, we are organizing that um, meeting on a regular basis. At the same time, we conduct health seminar, uh, which is uh, and uh, we ha conduct like health seminars by doctors and also that uh, like individual consultation service, which is provided by uh, experts like public health nurse and others. From 2016 to 2022, such seminar was organized 177 times in total. So uh, support for TUE, thyroid uh, ultrasonic um, examinations. I want to give you the overview. Concerning the primary uh, examination, we have established a booth so that you know, doctor, uh, physicians were able to explain the pre preliminary result of the exam examination using some images. 
in an uh, easy to understand way. In the confirmatory uh, e examination, nurses, um, mental health social workers, and clinical psychologists, and also medical social workers, they worked as a team to support the uh, the, uh, the person and uh, the participants as well as their family members from a psychological and also social uh, perspectives con uh, concerning their thyroid uh, gland. In higher generation of adolescent and young adult generation, uh, we are offering uh, now peer support uh, for the people who experienced uh, thyroid gland uh, cancer. And the participants of the exam examinations and also their their parents or guardians, uh, we uh, send uh, thyroid newsletters twice a year, and which includes our latest information as well as uh, Q and A, the frequent asked questions. So through these uh, activities. We are offering like the physical and also mental support to that uh, uh, the survey participants, or the, the sort of examination participants in their support, uh, in the family members. Next, about the activities, just focusing on TUE, in which was presented in uh, session one two. The first activity is that if uh, any school requests. Uh, we can send expert staff members uh, to the location of the school so that, that they can give a lecture, uh, so-called on-location lectures, to give uh, easy to understand explanations over TUE. Uh, um, so we can uh, offer accurate and easy to understand information. Uh, we have different uh, literatures or the uh, materials for elementary school children uh, and others. And the second uh, support is on location information sessions, which are offered to, uh, like, you know, um, this is upon request lectures on TUE, medical information on thyroid cancer uh, are provided to the family lectures, um, municipality, uh, teachers, municipality workers, and local residents in order to, uh, so that uh, people can deepen their understanding on the um, thyroid cancer. Mental health and lifestyle survey or MHLS. This was presented in session one, too. The support is very important in this survey. The experience of the earthquake and also that uh, nuclear power plant accident. The residents have like uh, anxiety and stress. So we need to understand their status and uh, health status accurately and also their uh, lifestyle too, so that we can offer appropriate care to each individual. So in MHLS, just like other um, surveys, we notify the result of uh, the, uh, the survey to each individual, including simple advice which can be useful for their health care. And also that individual, or oh, that we sent, sent a letter, including uh, that uh, the result. And based on support criteria, we offer telephone support as well. Uh, supporters uh, check the uh, physical and the mental uh, condition of the person, and they try to understand the needs of the person so that they can uh, offer. Um, uh, specialized advices as needed and now we are um, making a call uh, to about 3,000 people to offer support. The th uh, third one is sending out the pamphlets. We are sending out health information and also the contact information of our healthcare organization, uh, institutions and also where to consult to. Uh, this is so-called a support booklet. Uh, we can offer beneficial uh, information at the same time. Uh, we are providing information so that uh, they can receive additional support. The fourth support is that 
uh, we gather all the uh, the survey results from municipalities, and uh, when we have the liaison meeting among thirteen uh, municipalities, uh, we uh, provide uh, like uh, ex specialized or, or, or the uh, specialized advices or the um, advice from uh, from the experts. If anyone needs to receive a support, then and we collaborate with uh, re, uh, local uh, health and support organizations as well as healthcare organizations, so that people can receive support. Next, it's about uh, support activities for pregnancy and birth survey. So the, the main purpose is to provide support to um, people with pregnancy and in the giving birth. A dedicated uh, midwives and also health um, public health nurses um, make a phone call or send an email to offer a consultation support. And at the same time, a so-called support booklet for uh, mental and also physical conditions of uh, uh, mothers and also babies, and we uh, send uh, this send out this leaf leaflet at the same time we collaborate with uh, like a clinic uh, like a, uh, uh, with the clinics to offer support and this survey has been completed already but this the learning from this uh, survey can be used for uh, um, pregnant women in general and this is about the Eurozo Health Consultation at the municipalities events. So, um, residents have anxieties and stress, uh, uh, and then uh, we want to offer appropriate support to them. That was the, uh, for the to support their physical and the mental conditions, and it was organized uh, at municipalities uh, C H uh, C and also the um, uh, events to give the um, uh, medical check uh, results. So from 2012 to 2017, it was organized 723 times and until 2016. And from 2017, it was taken over by Fukushima Medical Association. Now, lastly, uh, next, I want to talk about liaison meetings with 13 municipalities. FHMS, uh, this is interested by Fukushima Prefecture. But collaboration with the municipalities and also uh, in providing support is the most important support. So at our center, So uh, we organize liaison um, meetings with 13 municipalities so that we can exchange information about the mental and physical status of the residents in Fukushima Prefecture, which we, uh, and uh, we are trying to use that to uh, offer st stronger support. And we exchange information with 13 municipalities, as you see on this slide, and uh, the public health nurses and health uh, and welfare staff members of the municipalities uh, attend this. By uh, strengthening such a collaboration, we want to be able to offer um, uh, appropriate and suitable support. In this meeting, person in charge from our center is engaged. The health communication, uh, the uh, Office of Risk Communication, Office of Health Communication, Office of Public Communication, International Cooperation, and, and those uh, members in those uh, organizations and relevant staff members of each survey take place in this meeting. The contents of this meeting is that 
the report which is given to the oversight committee, including the progress report on the survey and also the municipality specific report of each survey. And such information is shared among the municipalities to exchange opinions. The current status and the needs of health promotion activities. We have a free discussion over those topics. At the same time, we uh, introduce the information about the events, such as international sim symposium like today. So this is a photo from the liaison meeting uh, which took place in Minami Soma City. And we tried to create an environment so that the people can ex exchange their views freely about the contents of this liaison meeting. We mainly focus on the articles covered be, uh, covered in newspaper. At the same time, using 30 minutes towards the end of the session, we try to have a free discussion time. In 2021, uh, 17 times in total, 2022, 20 times this year, 22 in total so far that we have organized those sessions. And order to get from 2013 to 2022, we have conducted this meeting uh, 342 times in total. As a part of the support we offer in this liaison meeting, I want to introduce some of the support we have been providing on a continuous basis. And on the left, in Kawabuchi village, uh, we um, dispatch um, uh, uh, public health nurse so that uh, they can consult with the people. On the right, uh, the, that's the photo from um, so-called Dumbo exercise in order to promote uh, health. And there was a request. So uh, to send our uh, physical therapist and staff members actually liked it, and they also uh, participated in this exercise too. And th uh, this chart summarizes what I just explained to you. We as Radiation Medical Science Center for FHMS, our center and also 13 municipalities in the liaison meeting connect those two. Uh, based on, uh, we offer information uh, and also result of FHMS. And also we get uh, requests, comments, and questions from each municipality. This is managed by Risk, uh, risk communication uh, committee for evaluation of risk uh, risk communication, including internal and also external members, and we collaborate with the university. And if it's needed, we try to offer additional support as well. So uh, in the end, through this liaison meeting, in um, uh, the opinions and requests from 13 municipalities are factored into uh, FHMS as well. So to summarize, the support to residents uh, through FHMS is the most important uh, activity, especially uh, collaboration with those 13 municipalities are very important. So uh, we want to uh, uh, offer uh, information and going forward, uh, we will try our best so that uh, we can conduct survey and those activities which are in line with the requests and also the current status of those municipalities. Thank you very much for your attention. Dr. Tamaki, thank you very much. He talked about the liaison meeting with 13 municipalities and other support activities. It was a comprehensive uh, presentation. And uh, if you have a question, would you please you know, ask questions in the Q&A session in then. Now we are going to have a short break. That if you have any question to session two, no, we uh, so uh, we cannot. Uh, this is uh, we cannot take more questions anymore for section uh, session two. If you have uh, questions, would you please write down in the questionnaire and put it into the box? And we are going to re uh, start the next session from twenty five past four. Thank you. Session. So since it is time, I would like to start the discussion of the session two, and uh, 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 Doctor. Uh, Tsubokura and Dr. Mitsuki, please. Thank you, thank you, and thank you for waiting. And we'd like to have a discussion session for session two.
This session is about what to do in the future and what type of support do we need to have for the future. That is That should be the focus on this discussion. Uh, we have received a lot of questions. So uh, I'd like to ask the question uh, one by one to the professors and uh, Professor Gemma and the uh, fact um, uh, this is rather a confirmation of what you presented. One and a half year old uh, health checkup, and this uh, you, uh, uh, there was no data for the worse and also the impulsiveness. That's true. Uh, we didn't find that. So it is not the usual survey, uh, right? Uh, it is a different, and, and that the, the type of um, survey is different from region to region, and it is the municipalities who decide the um, items of the questionnaire. And they just happened as a coincidence, we had the same questionnaire item. So at the time of a disaster, you already had the survey plan on the specific item, yes. And uh, in that question, before compared before the disaster, uh, there is was an increase increase of what uh, uh, it doesn't dis, it's not described. Yes, is that true? But as I said, depending on the item, there was an increase, and uh, went up and down. And for instance, the late in learning uh, was. Uh, and depends on the item. So it's um it depends on the question and it depends on the, the characteristics. And some uh went back uh, immediately. And the next uh, question to Katahira san. And <clears throat> the first question to Mr. Katahira. And the, uh, the life through the food difficulty, you said that the, um, the increase in number of questions are related to the lifestyle. And what are the typical solutions that you suggest? Thank you very much. <laughs> Depending on the individual consultation question, of course, uh, the cases vary, but uh, as necessary, and uh, we each contact, uh, we refer to that the social welfare liaison uh, office and or local food bank uh, usage. And depending on the case, the, the contact, um, contact of the local government or the caseworker for the medical institutions. So we um, are bridging um, the, the people with such uh, professionals. So the social resources in the area is used so that um, the person can reach the support they can receive. Yes, that is the ideal situation that we are seeking to do. And sorry to uh, intervene, interrupt, sorry. And uh, the evacuees, how do they know your activities and uh, start to contact you? Uh, there is no formal analysis done, but uh, generally, not only the consultations, and there are some exchange um, forum. So through such event, the people know there is a point, point of contact. Yes, thank you very much. And sorry, uh, next, uh, Dr. Tamaki. But uh, you uh, talked about the uh, liaison uh, meeting. And uh, for instance, you have a lot of occasion to talk to the public health nurse. And what are, what are the atmosphere and questions do you get? And 
as far as you can tell us, could you share what type of um, people and uh, atmosphere you have? And as I said in the uh, presentation, 13 municipalities liaison office, a liaison meeting, rather than um, the ordinary citizens, they are the uh, staff members of the municipalities and the public health nurse from the municipalities. In the question I received, uh, for instance, the radioactive substance and the, the food related um, question, and there was a question if uh, I received such questions. But the, uh, the people we are talking to are uh, talking about the uh, insurance or the food. So it is true that uh, this question is not so relevant to me, but uh, I'm a um, radiology oncologist to begin with, and I see myself as a specialist, But and I'm hoping to provide the professional information from my side too. But, and when I ask the question, how is it? And then the public nurse, public health nurse, as their own feeling to the, the anxiety towards the uh, radiation is going down. So uh, it seems it is getting less uh, related to the question of the radioactive substances. However, uh, since I'm a specialist in radiation, I would like, I would like to, and I see the need of uh, providing the continuous information in my area of expertise. And uh, as much as possible, uh, we would like to establish the two-way communication. So, and uh, the people, the staff members of the municipalities, a lot of them do not know the detail about what we are doing. So, the present, what's presented, um, I. I uh, would like to summarize the contents so that uh, uh, accurately I can communicate with them. So as the information we receive, and 13 municipalities have a different situation, so it's hard to generalize that, but they have a hard time in while uh, when they pursue their activities. And the recent case is that the COVID response made that uh, public health nurse so busy about the vaccination. So by having the vaccination, they have more contact with the residents and, uh, and using that opportunity, the health, uh, public health nurse are communicating that the relevant information, and uh, I heard. And what was impressive was the returning situation from evacuation varies too. Um, originally, uh, what to do with the people who return and how, what can be done um, with the evacuees so that they can come home. And it is uh, very difficult to uh, have access. And the nurses are saying that it is difficult to have access uh, to the people who are evacuating. So I see uh, I have a lot of findings um, that I can only gain when I go to the field. So. Uh, we, I would like to provide the information to support them, and uh, I would like to uh, make the liaison a meeting so that they will be effective to uh, to promote the support. Thank you very much. Uh, and uh, uh, you, I have just heard that the additional information. I I believe uh, there are municipalities have uh, different phases and the, the lifting of that evacuation order happened a long time ago so with the, some municipalities, and some municipalities have only recently lifted the order. So, so depending on such phases, uh, we need to really tailor made that support. And going back to Dr. Uchiyama, and in your presentation, you said 
that the uh, impulsiveness and the world situation uh, 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 went down and improved again. And you mentioned, and what was surprising to me is the the low perception of the well-being of the parent that is impacting strongly and uh, that's convincing if you say so but uh, do you know the cause of that and what can be done for this thank you very much and the, the overall well, a sense of well-being is um, uh, captured the uh, different from FSA. So as an overall question, how do you feel? Uh, how do you feel your well-being on the great and so-so and that? And they are supposed to respond that way, and that is uh, used as one indicator. And also, uh, there are other items in that the uh, checkups. For instance, they cannot be energized or they can be energized. And we are using such items to do the analysis. But lack of support is often mentioned. And that is a subjective view. And also the long term of evacuation life. And that are linked with other factors. As I mentioned, that the state of the children, for instance, impulsiveness, uh, there, uh, I couldn't find a strong linkage uh, between that um, behavior and the mother's mood. And uh, in other um, city, uh, they have captured a good linkage. Then there, the developmental indicator of the child and the support needs are well linked. And the uh, uh, health state of the par parents or, or the mothers are linked with the uh, um, children's condition too. So in this silent city, the subjective view of the uh, mother is linked strongly with the overall perception of the well-being. So I shouldn't say uh, based on the estimate, but the Amazo Amadori, the social structure has changed, and the region itself has been changed. And the bad condition of the parents are strongly linked with the state of the uh, children, in my view. Thank you for your uh, answer. Uh, let me continue uh, my layman question. I can uh, vaguely image uh, what are the typical questions by the guardians or the parents. Uh, we um, sent um, psychological clinical psychologist uh, to the uh, infant health checkup right after the disaster in the year one and the year two uh, so many concerns were expressed regarding the uh, risks of the uh, radioactivity so uh, we considered it's important to um, deliver accurate information but in year three and year four um, uneasiness of the uh, children and some uh, expert concerns related to the changes of the family members. For example, the, uh, they become um, uh, there are fewer uh, number of the family members, and uh, the father uh, left Fukushima to get another job outside of the prefecture. And then we were required to give necessary advice. Also, a social structural change that they are no longer able to go to the kindergarten that they attended before the disaster. And that created some uneasiness among children. And as a result, there was a higher number of the uh, violence toward the children uh, in Hamadori area uh, compared to the level before the disaster. 
10年目、十五年目のこと、施設の保護者の方々への気持ち、どういう違いみたいなのがあるかみたいな感じで、また。Let me come back to this question regarding the hard,、uh, the trend has changed、uh, in the year five and year ten, and let me ask another question to Mr. Katahira. You provide support to、uh, all the、uh, residents、uh, throughout Japan. When you contact with uh, over uh, wide area evacuees, you might feel、uh, special challenges. Any, any conspicuous challenges are what? Thank you for that question. Now we are.、Um, Making the 13th year、uh, following the disaster. During that period, there h a s been a lot of other disasters, such as typhoon and also a disaster in Noto area recently. So,、uh, the word evacuation should not only be used to Evacuation associated with the、uh, Fukushima、uh, nuclear power plant disaster. And then it's hard for the general public to understand why they are in that area. So, lack of understanding. And how would that impact on the evacuees? Could you give me specific examples? So,、um, uh, instructions to,、uh, for evacuation w a s issued by the government、uh, following the nuclear power plant disasters, and some voluntarily、uh, evacuated, and some are、um, still registered as a resident in the evacuation zone area. There is um, some um, systematic、uh, support system. However,、uh, that is not always available 100%. Uh, maybe it's、um, uh, needed to、um, get them understood, and, but uh, still uh, it is hard. Allow me to ask you、uh, this、uh, layman's question. So,、uh, if you could elaborate. When an evacuee asks for support in the、uh, municipality that they are currently in, they cannot expect the smooth support. Is that what you mean? Right. Uh, they quite often ask why they do not register as a resident to that. The municipality when they ask for support in another municipality. When they commute and when they、uh, go to a school,、um, they have to make other people,、uh, people around them, understand that they are、uh, in that. A community for evacuation, not just a simple relocation or a change of the jobs. So they cannot ask、uh, the support and cannot get the support immediately in another municipality. And I quite often hear that case. How do you address that challenge? We typically co visit、uh, We also talk with the, the officer in that、uh, municipality.、Uh, there are a number of ways to address that. You've got the widespread network of support、uh, which enables you to give face to face support all throughout Japan. That might be、uh, quite a large encouragement for them. Okay, let me continue the question. 
Um, my question uh, then is, uh, what motivates you when you are engaged with uh, support of ev the wide area evacuees? What motivates you? Contrary to what I have just mentioned, when uh, another disaster hit us, my experience in the Fukushima uh, disaster is quite positively evaluated, and I we will be seen as a very trustworthy uh, contact. A number of uh, local government uh, have asked us for support. So uh, you are getting uh, more widely recognized among the uh, centers who offer support to the evacuees, not only among evacuees. OK, got it. Thank you. Now let me direct another question to Dr. Tamaki, a somewhat um, a different question. Uh, let me read it aloud. I have been living in Fukushima City. Right after the disaster, I have been worried about the high radiation dose, and some of the friends asked me to evacuate to their place, to join their places. Uh, but uh, uh, I uh, did all my, my own study, and uh, I got an information that it might be um, actually worse for my health to overly uh, concerned about the radiation hazard. But still, some of my friends are, are evacuated to a long distance place, and which makes me think that the uh, stigma associated with living in the Fukushima remains. And what kind of advice could you, can I get from you? I am a, a radiation oncologist, so my specialty is to use radiation to cure cancer. Radiation is a quite a tough thing to find a good and use of it. In Japan, uh, based on the result, uh, based on our history, uh, which include how Fukushima nuclear power plant accident have uh, developed, it's uh, in some way understandable that the people still have that uh, um, perception. In the presentations today, some uh, talked about uh, uh, perception, risk perception of uh, perception of hereditary risks. Right after disaster, 60% said there would be a risk, but uh, that has been improved and the percentage has reduced to 30%. But when we look at the uh, individuals, uh, there is a gap between uh, those stayed in the in Fukushima and those evacuated outside of Fukushima. The risk perception is of course higher outside of the uh, prefecture, and that is well reflected in the percentage figures. Now, people outside of Fukushima considers that the uh, hereditary risks are higher, so uh, it's actually hard to address this perception gap. So what can we do uh, to rectify the uh, bias? Uh, based on my own experience, let me talk about that. And I am a 
clinical radiology oncologist, and then where I have to uh, explain both of the benefits and the risks of using uh, radiology. And people will then understand that the fear and the risks of having a cancer is a lot higher than the fear or risks of having radiation therapy. And people start saying that I trust you, doctor. And sometimes they say that I do not understand the science, I but I trust you. Do whatever you want. Then, how to react to radiology and how to react to radioactivity, how to face the fear that, uh, or distrust. The attitude determines the action, and uh, I fear radioactivity. When people say that, you have to think about the background of the person saying that, and that's it, I believe, most important. And uh, for voluntary evacuees, says that uh, Fukushima is a dangerous place. Um, it's hard of for you to get them convinced that uh, actually uh, Fukushima is not a dangerous place to live in. Rather, you should address the source of their fear or try to get them trust you. And for me, that is more important. And if they say that they are concerned about um, radioactivity over the radiation, then you maybe uh, have to drill down their fear until uh, you can, uh, you two can discuss together as to what action could be taken to alleviate the fear, and that's where what the uh, risk communication is all about. It's important to talk about radiation and radioactivity, but there is something else that is totally a, an unrelated to uh, radioactivity, or fear, or anxiety, or peace of mind, and uh, your communication strategy needed to be positioned somewhere between the two. As this person said, we need to try to understand the needs. We need to have a close communication. After we establish such a relationship, then maybe. Oh, oh yes, we talked about that radiology issue before. As I'm like in past memory, I think this is relevant to FHMS too. FHMS is focusing on how to maintain the health of people, uh, the residents of Fukushima Prefecture, and we want to try our best to attain that uh, objective. And in the end, so there is not if people can feel like uh, uh, there is no like major impact from the radiation. Maybe that's how they can um, perceive that way. Uh, eventually, sorry, it was a very, very difficult question for you to answer. But with my apologies for that. But everyone who is engaged in the uh, um, radiations, and we have, you know, uh, we have uh, uh, encountered this. Uh, obstacles so many times and we have not been able to overcome this challenge yet. The scientific, scientific facts are important, but can we trust that if we, uh, you know, we uh, can only communicate the facts if we have a trust, trusting relationship. And of course, we are accumulating all the facts through FM, uh, FHMS. At the same time, we need to try to gain you know, uh, uh, the, uh, the trust. That's uh, very important as well. Thank you.
We have uh, other questions too, so may I ask you, Chairman Sign? Uh, sorry, Dr. Okutu Chiyama. So uh, you, t you shared a, a different, uh, uh, a wide range of data, including like in the temper and, other, uh, and others. Impulsiveness and K6 has been uh, coming down. However, it's higher than the uh, average in general. But uh, we have seen some improvement in some of the data. And uh, compared to that, you know, you're, the data you have, what um, is needed, not about the fifth year, but it has been 15, 13 years in looking at like uh, further down the line in the future, what will be needed? So would you please uh, elaborate on that? from that perspective. The data I showed you today, Hamadori area, and it's now, uh, Hamadori covers a, a big, a, a wide range of the area, and that is a regional difference. And uh, of course, within pre, pre, uh, pre, uh, Fukushima Prefecture, uh, Hamadori and other uh, areas are different. So we have to, you know, uh, um, be able to tr provide a suitable uh, support in each area. Hamadori, uh, we have a new um, uh, people uh, like moving to the area. There are like three different uh, groups of people, like people have been living in that area, and also people came to live in the area as a new residence, and uh, there are schools too. It's bit like uh, towns and uh, so villages. We need to check the situation in each area, and we need to think about what's needed to that particular town. For example, Hamadori is that how we call this uh, area, but within Hamadori area, uh, you know, the situation differs by the places. So K6, the result was a share, uh, as SD. Um, so we need to focus on each individual to offer different types of support. So I think that's like we need to focus on like more small, more granular areas. I think that's a key word. And what should be the optimal size of, for the area? Maybe it could change time to um, as time goes by. Uh, we macro or make micro, there are different units to describe that. But like a family by family, that can be one unit, or by town or by village, that can be another level. And and people have a different sense of value in different towns and uh, villages. We need to have a close communication with uh, uh, people in that particular area. Thank you very much. Um, Mr. Katahira. Next question. Let me read it out. COVID-19, because of that you know, spread of the infection, I understand that people's needs have been changed. So post-COVID, what is the direction of new way of what's the new needs? What, what kind of support you need to offer post-COVID? So this this is in not in the scope of the project uh, we have entrusted by the prefecture, but this is a view towards the future. Uh, earlier, I did not enough time to cover this. In order to solve the issues that people have who came for consultation, and, uh, we need to link them to the regional resources. Connecting them each time, case by case, then 
we won't be able to um, resolve those uh, challenges. So in, in, even if the, uh, in a normal state or normal situation, we need to uh, think about what kind of measures we should implement. As I said earlier, briefly that you know uh, it could be a an, uh, an, uh, big uh, you know disaster in the future too and we get we can think about different disasters too so uh, region by region all the organizations uh, and parties have to be collaborate with each other to achieve it no and it's difficult to have such a collaboration without a purpose. We have to have a purpose in order to collaborate with each other. So like a disaster control, like a disaster case management can be done. And other programs, uh, we need to uh, leverage those so that we can uh, establish an environment where we can have face-to-face -face communication. Thank you. One more question to you. So wide-range evacuees uh, on providing support to those people from the fifth year to the tenth year that needed support during that period and also further down the line, like, you know, like from 10 years from today until 15 years from today, what kind of support will be necessary? Is there any difference in the types of support to be um, required? As you know, time goes by, then uh, challenges uh, change. Uh, within, uh, when, uh, when 10 years passes by, then 40 years old person can, will become, uh, will turn into 50 years and 60 to 70. So in 20 years from today, that means that people who did not uh, receive nursing care, but they have to receive nursing care support and whether their parents have such a challenge. So chronological. Um, at that time can change the challenges for people. Is it a short-term support or a long-term support? They are different in a point of discussion, but region by region, we need to establish such a structure. I think that's important. Thank you. So we need to keep you know, changing about um, that too. I want to ask the same question to three uh, people, starting with Dr. Tamaki. For this session, what kind of support should be provided and also the, like, you know, uh, orig uh, as original purpose of FHMS. We want to keep, you know, um, keeping, supporting them in coming five years to 10 years, what are uh, will be needed? And I think this is a, a similar topic as Mr. Tak uh, Katahira uh, explained, but would you please um, share your thought? Concerning FHMS, based on the result of the survey, we need to um, try uh, keep striving in order to overcome such health related challenges and from my position radiology and also the image of Fukushima Prefecture, I think people will uh, start to forgetting. And, uh, as the people forget about uh, about it, then uh, maybe negative image can fade away too. But if uh, you know people st uh, stop talking about uh, Fukushima, then maybe negative image will be fixed in their mind. For example, the impact uh, effect from the radiation overdoses. We need to keep you know providing information. The data we found out through FHMS, we need to keep communicating that uh, uh, information, especially the impact on children. There was no impact on children. Uh, that was the finding from the uh, pregnancy and birth survey. Or, uh, thank you. 
Mr. Kata here, as Dr. Tamaki said. Uh, this kind of like, uh, you know, wide uh, area evacuees, you know, we still have that challenge and we need to keep keep talking about it. Last year, too, there was a company uh, there was a, a seminar focusing on social challenges, uh, social issues, and I attended that seminar, and people did not know that there are still are so many a wide uh, area evacuees today. This is the issue we have, and what is the current status? We need to keep uh, like communicating that message. Um, Dr. Uchiyama, please. Yes, and I think I will share the uh, same views. One point is like the effects uh, by the uh, radiation. People have negative perce perceptions, and after we repeat clinical studies, then uh, uh, we can finally eliminate such a negative perception. So accurate information uh, should be communicated on an ongoing basis, and also empower the local people, like local supporters. Uh, they can gain skill in order to support children and also their parents. I think that's uh, very important that the program that can be used by the local residents, if we need to develop such a program and offer that the program and local people can keep revising the program. And also uh, the guilt, there are many people who are feeling the, who are feeling the guilt among the uh, affected people. And then the supporters, uh, they have, uh, 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 they are feeling so stressful, and we need to uh, give them an the opportunity so that they can consult with the supporters. Sorry, I'm not a good timekeeper. We are behind the schedule. My apologies, but thank you very much for exchanging different views. And I'm now living in Fukushima. You know, the meal, um, fruits, fruits and vegetables, so delicious, and I cannot lose my weight. Still, but at the same time, that uh, nuclear power plant uh, accident, we need to keep communicating and providing information on the con on ongoing basis. But thank you very much for your time. This is the end of the session. So this concludes session two. We will proceed directly to our closing session with comments from Professor Hazama Akihiro. Even as a university vice president directing the Fukushima Global Medical Sciences Center, Professor Hazama chairs a busy and productive Department of Cellular and Integrative Physiology and directs a nonprofit organization called the Palm K Project to popularize medical knowledge among school children. So, Professor Hazama, as soon as the Podium is ready. Um, thank you very much for your uh, kind introduction. I am Dr. Hazama of uh, Fukushima Medical University. I would like to say a few words to close this symposium. In 2024, and to open the Fukushima Medical University International Symposium on Fukushima Health Management Survey, uh, uh, we are uh, uh, very grateful to get your support from many of you and uh, we are able to successfully conclude this symposium and thank you very much once again we feel honored to have a number of experts from japan and abroad speaking at this symposium and uh, they share their valuable insight from the field of their expertise and the discussion based on the questions from the participants was a meaningful opportunity to deepen our understanding of the fukushima health management survey and the current situation of fukushima i would like to take this moment to reflect on the contents of today's lectures and discussion 
Session one, our faculty gave presentations on the findings gained from the basic survey, underst understand the uh, external exposure doses and the detailed uh, survey to understand the health conditions. Keynote lecture by uh, Dr. May Abdel Wahab, a director of a division of human health department of nuclear science and application of IAEA, presented the recognition process of the radiation effects method of radiation risk assessment and the initiative to improve the risk communication between experts and the general uh, public. In session two, from the viewpoint of capitalizing on that they gained a knowledge, ongoing research and activities and their future prospects were presented and discussed to keep and promote the health of the people in Fukushima and to be uh, prepared for the emergencies in the future. And Dr. Tokyo uh, 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 Uchiyama, uh, Uchiyama Tokyo of Fukushima College introduced the initiative to study the necessary support needs based on the group questionnaire survey uh, with the parents of the children who experienced the disaster at their infant age because of the issues found in their language development. And director and the Secretary General of uh, Fukushima College, uh, Collaborative uh, Revitalization, Revitalization Center presented the support activities and consultation of the uh, and exchange program uh, or for evacuees living outside of um, Fukushima. Mr. Katahira uh, shared the importance of the supporting the evacuees as a local resident of the new communication based on the, the changing uh, consultation topics. It was a great pleasure to share thought-provoking uh, discussions from a wide range of perspectives and to gain the many meaningful insights. Our university will continue to contribute to reconstruct to reconstruction and the revitalization of uh, Fukushima by strengthening our ties with the world and will also continue to stay close to every one of the people of Fukushima to support them, uh, support their health through Fukushima Health Management Survey. In closing, I would like to express my sincere gratitude to all of you who participated and cooperated in this symposium and ask for your continuous understanding and cooperation to our university. Thank you very much. Thank you, Vice, Vice President, President Osama. This concludes our 2024 International Symposium. Dodi uh, san thank you for your hard work all day. I'm adding three new sentences. Do your best. Several times per year, in between these annual international symposiums, members of the Fukushima Health Management Survey present their findings to what is called Kento Iinkai, the Prefectural Oversight Committee. Each of these meetings is followed by a press conference. So, Kento Iinkai days are when questions from independent subject matter experts and media professionals have the highest priority. Back to March 2nd for the people, to all who have participated today in Tokyo, in Fukushima, and online from all around the world, thank you for your time and for your continued thoughts about how to share lessons of Fukushima with Japan and the world. Good evening. With that, 2024 
福島アメリカ・ユニバーシティ・インターナショナル・シンポジウム・オン・ザ・福島ヘルス・マネジメント・サーベイ・イズ・クローズド。ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、